for all coming tonight. Oh, give me one minute. Now we're all ready. Um, I'd like to call the uh, meeting to order for the uh, Waterfront Design Review Commission. And um, first order of business is to um, take a vote to approve the minutes from our last meeting. Can I have a motion? A second. Oh, I'm sorry, Dave, we made a motion. Second. Is there any discussion? Okay. All in favor, say aye. Motion approved. Next order of business is to just give a brief description of what our goal is here uh, with the Design Review Commission. Um, the goal of this committee is to review the guidelines as they relate to the project that has been presented and submitted to the city. Um, as part of the discussion tonight, um, we have an updated design guideline available here for you. No content has been changed other than adding numbers so that we can have proper discussion and relate to item numbers under certain applications. So it is here if you'd like to review it. Um, and um, if, there, if there's no question from the committee on that, we'd like to move to having Marshall give us a presentation of the project. Thank you, Mr. Amoroso. My name is Josh Berlinski. I'm a partner with the firm of Darrow Everett, and I represent the applicant Metacomet Property LLC, an affiliate of Marshall Development. As you all know, we are here tonight in support of our application for a mixed-use development at the site of the former Metacomet golf course. Our proposed development will create much-needed housing for renters and buyers alike in the greater Providence market, while simultaneously providing additional commercial space to broaden a depleted tax base here in the city and provide in-demand services for not just residents within the development, but throughout East Providence. The state of Rhode Island issued the fewest building permits per capita in the nation in 2023, according to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. On a per capita basis, Central Falls, North Providence, East Providence, Pawtucket, and Newport reported the fewest building permits in 2022. The lack of new housing has helped create a market where demand far outweighs supply, making it increasingly expensive to buy a home. The price of a single family home has doubled over the past decade. Officials at Rhode Island Housing recently estimated that the state needs to build an average of between 2,200 and 3,087 new housing units each year just to maintain the status quo. This development is proposed to contain approximately 890 residential units built out over 10 years. A mix of multifamily rental units containing approximately 845 units, 22 duplexes, and 24 townhouses. Consistent with the terms and provisions of the 2021 zone change for the property approved by the City Council, 10% of the proposed housing will be set aside and designated as affordable inclusionary housing. There is an opportunity for this development to contribute to alleviating to some extent the housing crisis the City and State are currently dealing with. For that end, and in furtherance of our shared vision of a mixed-use development that addresses and incorporates as many of the cities procedures, preferences, and recommendations as we have been able to accommodate, we have undertaken and participated in almost three years worth of meetings, hearings, and workshops with city boards and officials, as well as members of the public on issues both substantive and procedural in order to put forth a development plan that we can be proud of, that is consistent with the mandates and requirements of the city's comprehensive plan, and adheres in all material respects with the design guidelines of the Metacomet Subdistrict approved by the Waterfront Commission last year. And yet, we are well aware that our work is not done. In many ways, now that the Waterfront Commission and Design Review Committee have initiated their review of our application, it is just beginning. In addition to the architectural and engineering product that will be discussed here this evening, at the request of the East Providence Fire Department and the City's Department of Public Works, we are undertaking further testing and analysis to ensure sufficient utility capacity for the development. We have engaged fire suppression consultants to make sure the buildings we propose to construct 
are safer as inhabitants and consistent with the most up-to-date requirements of the city and state building codes. We have recently received the peer review reports commissioned by the city relating to our proposed stormwater design and traffic study and are working on detailed responses to each of them. Finally, we have engaged in a substantive dialogue with the Rhode Island Department of Transportation on our proposed alterations to the design and alignment of Veterans Memorial Parkway. While our initial feedback from DOT has been favorable, we freely acknowledge there is significantly more work to be done in that regard. As you know, the Waterfront Commission opened its hearing for this development back in February. At that meeting, the commission heard from financial analyst Todd Poole of the firm Forward Planning. Todd testified as to the estimated economic benefit of our development. Mr. Poole, whose report is currently under peer review, estimate a net fiscal impact for the city of East Providence of $4,855,270 from this development. Last month, continuing our focus on certain nine design elements, we presented the full commission with testimony from Deborah Cox, the president of the Public Archaeological Laboratory. Ms. Cox brought her considerable expertise to speak to the commission on an issue of significant importance to the developer, to the city, and of course, the public of large, that of the archaeological significance of the site. Ms. Cox explained the reasoning behind PAL's recommendation for a survey to be conducted at particular areas of higher elevation of the site and the roles that both the Rhode Island Historical Preservation and Heritage Commission, as well as the Narragansett Indian Tribal Council Preservation Office can and must play in that process. And that process is ongoing. Tonight, you will be hearing from our architect, John Selly from Phase Zero Design, as well as two members of our engineering team Matt Merva and Keith Curran from the firm Bowler Engineering, and finally our traffic consultant, Paul Bannon from Crossman Engineering. We also have available tonight Randy Collins, a landscape architect from the firm Beta Engineering, who the applicant recently brought on to assist with this project. Randy has significant experience in working with DOT and the Scenic Roadways Commission, and is also familiar with the rules, regulations, and requirements surrounding Veterans Memorial Parkway. Most importantly, we wanna thank you, the members of the Design Review Committee, for the candid and comprehensive feedback you have provided on this development, on everything from the design guidelines up to and including the design workshops late last year. Your input and insight has only improved the product we are putting before you this evening, and we hope that the spirit of collaboration and respectful exchange of ideas that has characterized this process thus far continues for the duration of our time together. The applicant and its team look forward to continued collaboration with the city staff, this committee, the commission, all consultants, and our neighbors to make this project a reality. Well, let's get into it. So our first witness is John Selly um, from Phase Zero Design, and he will be working through a slideshow that uh, we will put on the screens momentarily. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is John Selly, I'm with Phase Zero Design. We are, as Josh mentioned, the architects for the project. <clears throat> I want to thank you all for your, your time this evening. Um, certainly, we're excited to be here after you know, a couple of unfortunate delays. Uh, we're eager to talk in some detail about the design uh, for this development and certainly eager to hear and respond to any comments that you all have. Um, Our agenda for this evening, Josh mentioned briefly, we'll run through the architectural development plan overview. Uh, then we'll run through the site development, hitting landscape and lighting, also looking at grading drainage utilities. And then we'll uh, move to uh, offsite design, which includes traffic. And then at the end, we wanna do a little summary of, of how the overall development is, is meeting the intent of the design guidelines. get into the overall architectural and, and the master planning design for the development. Um, as we talk about this, and I, and I mentioned some of these overarching uh, master planning concepts uh, in our initial waterfront 
meeting. I want to get into those a little bit more tonight and talk in a little bit more detail about the, the architectural design as it relates to these overarching concepts. Um, but probably first and foremost, respecting the, the scenic nature of the Veterans Memorial Parkway has been top of mind throughout our development of, of the, the project and our, our master planning efforts. Um, certainly the uh, inclusion of the 100-foot buffer uh, along Veterans Memorial Parkway is a setback for the, the building. Certainly helps to uh, you know, make sure that the, the parkway maintains that scenic nature. Uh, Mr. Merva is going to speak a little bit more about what we're going to do in addition to maintaining the existing landscape that uh, exists along the, the parkway, what we're going to do to supplement that. Um, but we've been very careful you know, to keep as much paving out of that zone as, as possible as, as well. Um, there's a certain percentage allowed in the design guidelines, and we're nowhere near that. So we've, from day one, looked at keeping the buildings away from the parkway, looked at keeping all paving out of Excuse, that. Trip. Can you just hang tight for one minute? I think we're still having issues with still the presentation. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Just to keep it moving, I can keep speaking. Am I still streaming or is it just the screen? All right, I'll, I'll keep going just to, in, in the interest of time. But, um, so, you know, maintaining the scenic nature of the parkway. Another way that we're, we're helping to do that is by using small uh, residential scale buildings along the, the side of the development facing the parkway. We're using those buildings to buffer to uh, basically screen the parking lots that are on that side of the development. So when you're driving along the parkway, you're seeing these low residential scaled buildings that happen to be commercial and retail in nature, um, but we're using those to screen so you're not seeing fields of parking. Um, another overarching master planning concept that we're, we're using here is, is how we've zoned the overall site in terms of the uses on the site. So we're trying to, to be good neighbors, really. We're keeping all of the residential uses closest to the residential properties, the community surrounding the east side of the site. We're keeping all of the retail and commercial on the west and north sides of the site, which are you know adjacent to other commercials on the property north of us, um, in addition to you know just where we've zoned this, the uses on the site, we're looking at the massing of the buildings in a, in a similar way to try to keep the buildings around the perimeter of the site where they might have some visual impact on the surrounding community, keeping those low. So all of the buildings along Veterans Memorial Parkway are one to two stories. The buildings on the uh, the Fort Street side are all three or two stories, and it's only really once you get into the middle of the site, which it's it's a very large site. I know most of you have walked it at this point. Only in the very middle of the the property are we proposing to do any four and five story buildings. We've kept all of the high, the larger buildings toward the, the center of the site to reduce the impact on our on the community surrounding the property. Are we back on with the screen? I'd like to we move forward one. Great, thank you. So yes. just to speak a little bit more specific. Excuse me a minute, go ahead. Public comment will be after the hearing. Please hold your comments to the end, thank you. Thank you. So to, to speak to some of the specific uses that are being proposed on the site, again, as Josh mentioned, it's a predominantly residential uh, focused development, uh, 890 units of uh, residential, but appealing to a broad uh, demographic. So we have you know, something that's gonna appeal to young professionals looking for their first apartment, uh, to empty nesters looking for a smaller you know, place to live that may be walkable to restaurants and you know, right next to a golf course is a great amenity, obviously. Um, also some family accommodations in some larger townhomes on the property. And then in the sort of Northwest corner, also an area that may be 55 plus, so some senior living options on the property. Again, appealing to a broad demographic, you know, filling this this you know housing need, as uh, Mr. Bulinski was uh, you know, clear in, in discussing. Um, so, residential is in the upper uh, right corner of the site here, so the north and, and east sides of the site. Um, then on the the west is really where we have all of the commercial retail. I'm going to zoom in. If it still works. Can you advance to the next slide, please?
No, that went too far. Sorry, that went three or four. Uh, go the other way. There we go. Oh, back, back just one more. Yep, thank you. So this is a little bit closer up view of the, the more commercial side of the site. So the retail end of things is anchored by the uh, grocery store, which is the large block on the, the north part of the site here that you see. Um, also on that side of the site, uh, accessed off of Lion Avenue, we have some other service-oriented retail. There's a building that may be a childcare, maybe some additional retail. We have a drive through coffee shop on that side. And then as you move further south on the property across the internal uh, rotary, you get into an area that we're, we're calling the town center, which is really the heart of the development. So the intent for that town center area is really a really pedestrian focused retail experience. So you can drive in, park, park once, but then you know, walk through this end of the development, visit small retail shops. You know, these are not large, big, big box stores by any means. They're small retail, hoping to attract some local boutique type retail into those spaces. Uh, we also have a, a drive-through bank on that area, again, service oriented, a couple of restaurants with some outdoor dining. Uh, and then the, the larger building on the sort of southernmost part there is the building that will serve the, the golf functions, but it was also going to uh, contain a food hall. So again, an opportunity to bring some local vendors in there, get kind of a farmer's market type atmosphere going. Um, as you can see on the sort of south uh, west corner there, we're proposing an amphitheater that's overlooked by what we're calling a promenade, which is an area that you, know, you could bring food trucks in and have all kinds of great uh, community activity going on in, in this area of the site. It's really intended to be a, a town center that's a great amenity, a resource for folks that would live on the site, but also a draw for the, the surrounding community, something that folks that, that live in the area could come and enjoy the, the festivities that are happening in this area as well. Okay, next slide, please. Great, thank you. So to talk a little bit more about the architectural ideas for this, you know, it really takes off from that town center concept um, and thinking of you know, what can we do architecturally to kind of portray this traditional New England town center. So we're really you know, building on that idea of a, of a really great pedestrian experience, trying to keep the architecture with a lot of low scale, again, residential scale, but um, a lot of detail that will be interesting to pedestrians you know, walking through the area. So we're using you know, things that you would see in traditional New England architecture, pitched roofs uh, with architectural asphalt shingles. We're using a lot of um, cedar shingle siding, trying to get that sort of coastal New England feel into the development. You know, a lot of clabbered uh, dormers on some of the buildings, cupola that you see back there on the building that's going to you know, have the, the golf and the, uh, the food hall function. And again, sort of bringing in these you know, areas of seating in the pedestrian areas, areas of outdoor dining, things like that to, to bring excitement to this uh, town hall area. Great, my clicker's working again. Okay, so in our submission, we've included the proposed palette of materials, all of the materials that we're proposing to use within this kind of warm, natural New England style of, of material are all allowed under the design guidelines. So we think all of this is, is compliant. And in the, the submittal package, we won't go through every elevation of every building we, we have in the proposed uh, this evening, but all of these materials are called out on the elevations that are included in the, the full submittal. So I'll just walk you through some of the views that we've developed of the, of the, uh, the overall development, give you a sense of the look and feel. So this is an aerial looking over the promenade, promenade area with the sort of food truck activity. You see the restaurants on the left side here, uh, you know, maybe that spill out onto to some tents. There could be a dining or a sort of wedding venue under some of these tents. Um, the food hall building you're seeing back on the right side and then that sort of retail area another view of that same town town center area from another perspective here again you know looking for lots of uh, pedestrian activity in, in this end of things but i think this is also a good view where you can get a sense of how the the parking field is pulled in into the inner part of the site so if you're driving on the parkway you're seeing the buildings you know in that park area you're not seeing the the field of parking from the from veterans memorial parkway so this is a view along the parkway, looking at the vehicular entrance off of Veterans Memorial Parkway. We are proposing a couple of signs along the parkway. One here just to introduce the development. We're using similar materials on the signage that we're pro proposing for the development. Uh, so again, that sort of New England feel to it. 
um, signage happens to be one of the areas that we are seeking relief in the development. This is a view that we added out of our conversations, uh, you know, in the workshop. We wanted to see another view looking back toward the buildings that, uh, that sort of frame that town center area as, as seen from the parkway. So you can see our intent is really, you know, this park-like space. There are walking trails uh, all through the, the green buffer space here that can connect, connect you you know, sort of a long Veterans Memorial Parkway, but back into the development as well. This is a view a little bit farther north on Veterans Memorial Parkway, looking back at that same vehicular entry. And then moving farther north yet on Veterans Memorial Parkway at the proposed rotary, looking back at the development, you can see the grocery store uh, in the sort of background there. So it's this one gives you a, a sense of the scale of the site. It's really a, a large site. Even a, a large grocery store like that from the rotary looks like it's well set back from the parkway. This is a view looking along Lyon Avenue at the toward the back of the grocery store. Then we turn right and look into the development grocery store on the left. You're sort of looking now straight ahead toward the town center area and the development. This is the internal rotary in the property looking back toward the grocery store. And then just beyond that rotary, looking more toward the residential side of the property. This is uh, the grocery store parking lot would be just to your left here. You can get, get a sense now that we're sort of deep into the middle of the site. You start to see some of these four and five story buildings with some of the taller residential that's really you know, only at the inter interior part of the property. This is a view now down on the uh, more townhome end of the site. So those buildings on the left are, are duplex townhomes face out onto the golf course. So those would really be, you know, it would be visible, if at all, from the surrounding community, buffering the, the higher buildings behind. And then coming back now, a couple more views of the town center area, just to give you a, a sense of that sort of look and feel of the pedestrian retail experience. One more view over the, the promenade. And a view from the cove below. So, just, I want to move along here because we have other, other folks to speak, but also in the development, uh, in the package that we've fully submitted, we do have elevations for each of the buildings that we're proposing on the property. Um, all of those have additional detail on the elevations that call out specific numbers of, or per, specific percentage of glazing. Um, that's another area we're asking for relief. We are meeting the overall uh, percentage of glazing that's required by the guidelines, but there are a few individual facades, particularly some of the, the backsides of the, the retail where it's, it's challenging to get a full 25% glazing on some of those facades where you really need that wall area on the interior for services and other things like that. But that said, we are fully aware that we need to be looking at all four elevations of each building as we design the, the buildings in this development, and we have done so and included all of those elevations in the submission. Well, certainly welcome any comments. That wraps it for architecture. Thank you again for your time this evening. Hey, Leith. Um, I know we're reviewing the whole project here as a whole, but it is going to be phased. So is, is there going to be some discussion about phasing in the previous ones? OK, thank you. Great. If I could just piggyback one more comment on that, because it does relate to phasing and architecture. Certainly, everything that we've proposed is, is conceptual designs. We don't have tenants yet, right? Because the de development hasn't been approved. When we get tenants on board, you know, I think of the, the grocery store for certain will want to have some input into the design of that building. Certainly the things like that, I think we can come back in front of the design review committee with final designs before they're submitted for building permit. Sure. Yeah, we'd like to, you guys give your whole presentation and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll have our comments from there. This way we don't hold you up and we make sure you get through all the information. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Merva with Bowler. Uh, I'm a registered landscape architect. I run our planning and landscape architectural group at Bowler uh, for the Northeast. Uh, we've been working with the Marshalls for a few years now, uh, pulling plans together that you see tonight and some of you've already seen. Uh, but we're really excited at the, the progress that we've made uh, with the help of, of some of the design workshops that we've had. 
uh, over the past few months. And um, I think John Selly did a great job of uh, enumerating some of those uh, modifications that have come, come out of that process. Uh, but I'm just going to briefly uh, run through some of the site development um, overall and then get into a little more detail on landscape and lighting as well uh, before I turn it over to my associate Keith Curran uh, who will run through some of the engineering on uh, grading and drainage and stormwater. Now let me see if I can get this to work. Okay, so the plan uh, that you've seen here, uh, John mentioned already, um, sort of the overall configuration of the site. One of the, um, and it doesn't go on there. It's too bad. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one of the organizing elements of the plan is really the boulevard uh, that extends from Veterans Memorial through the site to the various uses, as well as um, the access from the rotary uh, through the grocery store. These are tree lined streets. They're intended to be very pedestrian friendly. Uh, they form sort of a, the, the core and the uh, part of the amenity package itself, uh, those are, um, they'll have street trees at regular intervals, uh, street lights, uh, and sidewalks on both sides that connect us right into that core kind of town center uh, that John mentioned, and we'll zoom into that a little more. Uh, one of the great comments we got in some of the workshops uh, with, with the folks here um, were really to just kind of take the plan in layers and start to look at it from uh, from the basis of different systems that are that are happening on site. Uh, so one of the things we looked at was. Can you advance to the next slide for me? Thanks. There we go. Yes. So this just graphically breaks down the uses by buildings uh, in a in a pretty clear way. So you can see the purple is really the commercial. Uh, the orange color is the uh, multifamily apartment retail, uh, residential. And the lighter yellow towards the bottom at the golf course are the uh, lower density townhomes um, and duplexes. And then the tan color in the upper right corner is sort of the senior living that, that John mentioned. So this, this just kind of breaks down that layer of land use. It makes it a little easier to see. So uh, if you can click to the next slide. In terms of phasing, uh, Steve, to your question, this, this highlights what we anticipate to be phase one in yellow, which would include the grocery store, uh, the town center retail on, along the frontage, uh, as well as a portion of the apartments in the lower right corner of that yellow area. Uh, the later phase, phase two, uh, would contain additional residential, uh, the senior living component, as well as additional uh, apartments, residential, and the townhome multifamily as well. Uh, next slide, if you would. It wasn't last time. Okay. Did I do that or did you do that? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so this, this plan just highlights the buffers that we have on the site. Uh, you can see we, we've obviously excluded the nine acres that seem deeded to the city in the upper right corner, but from that nine acres, we still have a 50-foot buffer along that edge to any structures. Uh, there's the 100-foot buffer along Veterans Memorial Parkway that John Selle already mentioned, and then the, uh, the typical setbacks along uh, Port and Ryan. We also wanted to highlight the, the pedestrian circulation. This has come up a few times and, and really just wanted to kind of pop that layer out so that people could understand it. All of the red lines you see there will be uh, pedestrian pathways, walkways throughout the site, connecting all the different uses uh, as well as to the surrounding streets. And then the blue dashed line, which I don't know if the color's reading great from where you're sitting, but that connects us from our internal path network uh, around the rotary and across to the bike path um, across Veterans Memorial. So we will have a, a pedestrian and bike connection uh, over to that side of the road so that there is connectivity to that, that existing great amenity along the, along the river. Uh, next slide, please. All right, back in business. 
Uh, so just to highlight some of the, the landscape, um, we wanted to uh, pull this plan out to show uh, sort of where the existing trees to remain will be. Uh, there are some existing trees that will be removed, obviously, in the development area, and then the trees that we are proposing. Uh, so by the numbers, um, we've, we've got about 87 or so trees um, to remain on the property. Uh, we're removing approximately 269 in that development area, but adding uh, 681 new trees throughout that development area, uh, which will more than make up for those that are lost. So our total net new trees is uh, 412 um, by the, uh, the calculations that we did. So those are broken down by, by color code there. Um, and then in terms of open space, uh, this just highlights publicly accessible open space uh, in the, the green area. I have the minty color in the upper right corner is that, that town land now, uh, city, and, uh, and the pink areas would be more uh, sort of private terraces and pool areas for the residential, uh, but an interconnected system of open space linked by all of those walkways we just mentioned and the boulevard that I mentioned. Uh, so when you overlay those together, you see what the, the interconnected open space looks like. The orange color highlights kind of the town center pedestrian area uh, adjacent to the, uh, the amphitheater use. Really, that's going to be an outdoor amenity open to the public, you know, cafe tables and seating, uh, a lot of activity, programmed events, um, and a real active pedestrian-oriented space that is separated from the parking by the architecture that, that John just highlighted. Uh, so that really kind of forms the heart of the, the community here uh, on the site. And obviously, all are, are welcome there. So uh, pretty excited about that component. We're going to zoom in on it a little bit just to give you a sense of, of the scale of that. Uh, this highlights our proposed landscape plan. So we've enumerated the, the species that we'll be utilizing in the chart below there. That's all part of the package that's been submitted. Uh, a little tough to see at this scale, but there are you know, individual sheets um, for each of the, the five quadrants up there that will be spelled out later. Uh, zooming in, as I mentioned, on that town center. So this, this starts to highlight some of the materials in the landscape uh, of that pedestrian promenade that connects the parking areas and the, the drop-off space down into uh, the retail shop area. It faces out onto that center spine with uh, ornamental trees, uh, decorative lighting, uh, bollards, furnishings, benches, um, all leading down to the, the promenade that, that John Selly mentioned uh, along the curve of the uh, upper portion of that amphitheater there. That's a, a large, open, programmable space that, that can be used for a lot of different events. Uh, so we're excited for, for what that offers uh, for the future here. One of the great comments we received also, I'm just going to jump back quickly to the overall master plan. Uh, now I've run it. There we go. Um, I wish I could point, but the... Um, there's sort of a, a division where, where we leave kind of the public streetscape and enter into the uh, more residential areas, which are, are still obviously accessible to everyone. But we've really tried to highlight the intersection at the corner that comes down from, uh, from Lion Ave and with our boulevard uh, to create sort of a gateway into the residential area there. And that is shown in upper right corner of, of this slide here. So you can see um, the image in the upper right shows the intersection treatment and a specialty paving that, that creates almost a rumble strip and a gateway entry into the, uh, the residential neighborhoods beyond. So the public is really focused more on uh, moving in, in and up back to uh, Lion Avenue versus further into the site, into those residential areas. The other area I wanted to highlight was the pocket park 
see in the lower right corner. And that sits up along uh, Lion Ave as well. It's directly adjacent to the land that's been deeded to the city. This provides an opportunity for crosswalk and a, a connection to, uh, to the pond and Pierce Park uh, to the north there, uh, but also seating area, uh, just an outdoor kind of passive recreation space that's kind of a stop along the way of the, uh, the pedestrian connection. Touching on lighting quickly, uh, this, this highlights kind of the hierarchy of the, the lighting that we're providing on site. So the, the taller poles, uh, we, we've shown images of each of the light types on the left. Uh, the parking lot lighting would be sort of a traditional razor LED, uh, kind of a low profile, minimal light spill. Everything's gonna be dark sky compliant here. Um, the, the street lights and the more traditional looking uh, lantern fixtures you see to the left down there, uh, those, while they look like a traditional globe fixture, those are actually LED lights as well. The, uh, the light source sits in the cap, uh, not in the, the um, sort of open area of that light. So you will not see the light source. It's very uh, customizable and, and directable. Uh, to make sure that there's no light spill off-site or, or glare. Uh, I think somebody referred to some of these globe fixtures as glare bombs before. These are not those kind of lights. They're sort of traditional open fixtures, more uh, state-of-the-art, uh, and will provide um, adequate lighting, but without, without producing that glare and spill. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Keith, and uh, obviously we'll be here to answer any questions. Thank you. As I mentioned, my name is Keith Cowan. I'm a senior project manager at Boulder. Uh, my presentation is going to be very short. I actually only have two slides. First slide, uh, again, tough to see at the scale, but this is the grading and drainage plan. So um, when we graded the site, we basically balanced the site, so therefore the cut and fill um, balance. Note, um, predominantly, the um, site goes pulled down to the cold. That's the way it presently goes. That's the way it's going to drain in the proposed condition. Shown on this plan is in blue, uh, basically subsurface infiltration chambers, and the green are basically above grade. The largest green, just to note, that's a wet tension basin. The rest of them are basically are infiltrated. So that one actually kind of cold water, and as noted before, actually it's kind of the many you can kind of just walk around it. Uh, to note for the drainage, uh, we have to meet all, and we will comply with all LIDEM standards, which includes LID practices, groundwater recharge, water quality treatment, uh, conveyance protection, pollution prevention. Another thing to note though is because of the cove is a coastal water, we don't have to meet the uh, low attenuation, so that'll be waived. We already have something called with CRMP, who will be the approving authority from the state. So that's just to note that again, all of the site drainage is going through, through the cove. Right now, there's an existing 24-inch uh, pipe there. We're proposing to upside it to uh, a 36 -inch. Um, besides the infiltration basins and uh, explained basin I showed you, we also have deep infiltrated catch basins. We have a bio uh, retention basin, and then we also have some filters and water quality units to treat runoff. Next slide is the utility plan. Probably should have beefed up the plan uh, line here a little bit, maybe tough to see, but in blue is the water. So we have already had comments from DPW and engineering and fire department, and we are presently, as Josh mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, we're uh, reviewing the capacity analysis and distribution system for both domestic and fire protection. And that is, and that is in the works. Uh, in green, you'll see sewer. All the sewer is heading to one point, which is just, again, just down page or southeast of the development, basically between the development and the existing golf course. We'll be tying into a manhole that then discharges through a tenant existing pipe all the way out to the parkway. Uh, we presently have under, um, Marshall presently has under scope or under contract, we want to video and TV that line to make sure, to confirm, first of all, that it is 10 inch based on the further information, but also to make sure the condition. So it's an older pipe, so we want to make sure that it's actually structurally sound. If not, uh, we'll actually replace the pipe, align the pipe, and make sure. And that also includes correcting any existing manholes in the work that we've done. 
whole sewer flow from this development um, is about 179,000 gallons per day. Uh, and then using a peaking track at four, we have firm that is sending these pipes and trying to handle that amount of flow. So again, whole development gravity to the existing um, infrastructure that is in uh, Memorial Parkway, that's in Memorial. Um, another, color, another utility there is gas that is shown in yellow. So that again, we're showing that connection uh, to Ryan Ave. And then in red is the proposed electric and telephone phone connections in Lion Ave and Fort. Just want to backtrack, just back to the water. We're actually presently showing two connections to the line that is in Lions. And one connection it shows in this plan that is just tying out to Fort. It will, it will not. It actually will have to go to probably Juniper Street. And then we're working with the DPW with the 12 inch line there. And most likely there'll be offset improvements from the line from the site and connecting that existing 12 inch line that is in that is in Fort. And just to note, and just to just to note again that we have received and we are working. We have met with DPW. Um, we're working through a couple of their comments, and also PAR has reviewed our stormwater, and we will be addressing this very soon. I'm Paul Bannon. Now we'll talk about the future improvements. smaller than these guys. I'm often told that, but uh, good evening for the board. Uh, my name is Paul Bannon, project, uh, Senior Project Director with, with Crossman Engineering. Uh, we were retained by the owner uh, to assess the transportation related impacts uh, of the mixed use development and coordinate the final design and permitting uh, with um, that, that's needed to accommodate the future traffic demands uh, for the project. I've been working on development projects over the last 20 years along the parkway um, and have a thorough and familiar um, understanding of this roadway, uh, the roadway, its characteristics uh, and operations. I drive it on a daily basis. <clears throat> we understand uh, that a preliminary planning level traffic study was completed um, on this property by Vinas and Associates that was submitted with the uh, application along with the Crossman study. Uh, the BAA, AI report was an extensive um, traffic study that inventoried the project air roadways infrastructure, defined and assessed um, the physical, geometric, and traffic and operational conditions along the roadway, uh, and made preliminary recommendations um, to mitigate impacts and provide safe and adequate access to the development. As part of our effort, we reviewed and updated and have advanced those findings and recommendations as part of our final design effort. Uh, and made changes as appropriate to meet the goals of the city uh, and the Waterfront Commission and other review agencies based upon our experience of other projects that have been permitted along the park. In order to make these necessary infrastructure improvements, we need to coordinate with the city department, the Rhode Island Department of Transportation, and the Roadway, Scenic Roadways Board um, to obtain their approval. In order to adequately determine the potential impacts of development to prepare our study and conceptual plans um, and preparing the preliminary physical alteration permit and submitted to the Department of Transportation, um, we completed uh, a number of tasks. First, we reviewed the project site plans uh, as they were being developed with uh, Bowler uh, to ensure that the driveway's location and geometry were appropriate. Uh, for the traffic demand. We reviewed the previous studies that have been completed for the parcel um, and other private development projects along the parkway. We reviewed the City of East Providence comprehensive plans uh, relating to the transportation element uh, for it, uh, the Waterfront Commission's Waterfront Special Development District plan, uh, the Metacomic District design guidelines, and the Veterans Memorial Parkway stewardship plans as part of our, our research on, on the parkway and, and history. We then uh, initiated our own investigations of the project area <clears throat> to confirm corrected data and information in the studies and observed traffic operations inventoried uh, and, and confirmed roadway geometry, signage, traffic control uh, features were consistent. Um, based on the age of the traffic data in the original study, 
uh, we completed our own traffic data collection effort uh, this past year, uh, completing both automatic traffic report accounts in a seven day period, also peak hour minutes in the evening. We then updated the uh, trip generation estimate for the current development plan that has been submitted to this uh, city and is under review to come up with final numbers uh, for this site. Uh, with, with the information, um, we assess the safety and operation of the adjacent roadways uh, and the points of access and the appropriate design treatments that we have received at this point. Uh, we developed the conceptual roadway and intersection plan that we have been submitted to the state as part of what we call a preliminary physical operation permit. <clears throat> so they have an understanding of what is being proposed and uh, they'll before we get into the final design effort and formal application, they'll get an understanding from them that they agree in concept with our proposal and just complete the final design uh, and submit a formal application. So we're going through that process now. Uh, briefly going over the project, um, proposed on the 138 acre Metacomet Country Club property, uh, maintaining nine holes at the former course and then developing the upland portion as we've just described. Along the parkway, other properties, land uses include residential along the easterly side of the roadway, um, except for a, a few commercial properties, including the Metacomet Office Park and the Great North Park. Um, along the waterfront, <clears throat> there were uh, two um, high industrial type uses, uh, the Chevron property um, in, in the Chemical property that was in Metal Point. Metal Point is presently remediated and is fully redeveloped with residential and university orthopedics. Um, the Chevron property is remediated and ready to develop. Uh, and we, we met with those owners uh, for the, that future um, development plan. But as of today, they, they have no concept of what they're doing. <clears throat> they're working on some other things. Um, Veterans Memorial Parkway, um, it's a urban minor arterial. Um, it is a, a state DOT roadway, uh, uh, DEM roadway, and maintained by DEM in cooperation with the tribe. <clears throat> it was constructed in 19, between 1910 and 1920, um, and was 1992 was designated as a scenic highway. <clears throat> the roadway is generally 40 feet wide. Along its length, uh, speed limit is 40 miles an hour. Traffic vo <coughs> volumes that were obtained as part of our effort, um, we found that they've remained relatively constant over the last 20 plus years between roughly 16 and 18,000 vehicles per day. And <coughs> volumes along the parkway are highly influenced by, thank you, what um, is experienced on the freeway uh, is traffic congestion on Route 195 increases. Uh, the avoidance of uh, that congestion is impacting the local streets. Drivers try to get to uh, a point closest to Washington, the Washington Bridge, which uh, is a free flow beyond that. So what goes on on the, on the freeway affects what happens on the local See that today, um, but today, currently, uh, with our numbers, the roadway service roughly sixteen thousand five hundred vehicles per day. During the morning peak, uh, it services roughly thirteen hundred vehicles, and in the afternoon peak, thirteen hundred. This is uh, a few hundred vehicles less than over ten years ago, uh, and that had to do with a lot of that area and some pieces were avoided by volumes and uh, Lion Ave, uh, the local 28 foot roadway, 12 foot lanes, uh, two foot shoulders, 188 with WL center line posted at 25 miles an hour. Uh, there are no sidewalks in our area. Uh, there is um, the park, uh, the golf course, and then the park across the street. Uh, there are sidewalks and curbing, 
uh, to the east to Queen Ford. Uh, Lion today services roughly a thousand vehicles per day, uh, roughly a hundred vehicles. A month. Presently, all intersections and driveways uh, were found to operate efficiently during this uh, based on some studies done in the past. Under future conditions, as discussed, we're introducing. 90 residential units and approximately 150,000 square feet of uh, commercial. These uses translate into during the morning peak hour, 900 road trips, uh, PM 1800 trips, Saturday 1800 trips. That's a very conservative number. Those, are not, those numbers don't take into consideration internal capture of the site itself there we will have resident the resident residential within the development going to the commercial uses grocery store coffee shop so those that traffic never gets to the adjacent road if that included in when we Look at the operations for under traffic, um, not traffic study. We look at what we call the peak hour, and that would be a combination of site related traffic with adjacent roadway. So, that worst case condition, we look at what we did before uh, our intersections in, in those areas. And so, based upon, <coughs> excuse me, based upon the increase in traffic during these. Peaks, um, we wanted to limit the impacts along the parkway. Um, and our goal uh, focused the site access um, to the Lion Ave intersection. Fighting. As I had discussed, the, the main arterial is different than most roadways under state jurisdiction where the property access and design elements um, require careful consideration uh, in coordination with the appropriate agency is, a, is designated to the scene of highway. Introduction of new driveways and potential intersection controls have been discouraged over the years as outlined in the Veterans Memorial Parkway Stewardship Plan. The design of this project has been considerate of those concerns um, some changes to the character of the parkway and the design elements uh, that we have looked at are consistent with that plan. Therefore, uh, the new driveway to the site um, with control has not been proposed um, along the parkway. The existing driveway will be modified and shifted further away from um, Lion Ave. <clears throat> the Lion Ave junction will become, excuse me, the um, the major intersection along the parkway. Um, and it will be designed in a context, context sensitive manner, um, consistent with what was proposed uh, 15 years ago. Um, development of the, the Chevron site is still anticipated, and we're considering that. Uh, of the round um, the um, the type of design that we're proposing is preferred by the RIDOT over um, traffic signal because it has greater capacity and is, uh, provides a safer intersection with um, lower crash rate and lower speeds and, and less vehicle conflicts. Typically when we uh, Work on DOT projects when we are, we are replacing traffic signals. They ask us to look at a roundabout that was used to replace them because of those uh, benefits of a roundabout uh, with the, with the safety uh, and, and also long term cost. Um, in order to just introduce traffic control at one location, 
um, as I said, we're just uh, moving the driveway on the parkway, and not making that a main um, intersection. In order to do that, we're restricting left turn uh, egress from the site. All left turns will be made with Lion Ave in, into the roundabout. So that way, um, we've been able to minimize impact uh, to the parkway based on that design. Um, we have uh, initiated discussions with the RIDOT, uh, RIPTA, and the media partners relating to construction of the road improvement. Um, and <clears throat> it's also important that we coordinate with RIDOT now because they have a program for improvement, excuse me, along the parkway uh, in the next a year or so uh, for resurfacing. So we want to work with them uh, to make sure that money isn't wasted. Uh, projects are coordinated. Um, we'll also be coordinating with local public safety officials uh, and public works uh, to make uh, necessary improvements on the local streets. Uh, we understand that public works has a section of uh, Lion Ave designed for construction, and we'll coordinate that effort uh, with them, um, making any adjustments that we seem appropriate and working with the public uh, safety officials. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Mr. Amaro, so that concludes our, our presentation. We have obviously all the consultants are here to answer questions as well as Mr. Collins, uh, who's not presenting but is here to offer any questions that relate to his area's expertise. So thank you. Thank you. So we're um we're going to proceed with discussion of the um, design guidelines as a committee here. Just a reminder, today is a discussion meeting. No recommendations, formal recommendations will be made. This is our first time going through the process. So we are going to start with the uh, waterfront guidelines that have been you know, advertised publicly. And we're going to walk through each section talk with our commission members and get their comments, feedback, provide additional comments to the developer. On the, on the completion of that, we will open up to public comments. So please hold your comments until then. Thank you. All right. So everyone in front of you should have a uh, copy of the Metacomet District Guidelines. Um, so We'd like to walk through the process here first. Chairman, if you can indulge me for 30 seconds, we have some corresponding slides fortuitously that laid them out. So um, we seem to have lost clicker capacity. So if you give us 30 seconds, um, we should be able to get those up and, and see if we can take a, see if we can all read along. That would be really helpful. Thank you. So we may also ask to, uh, to there we go, to go right. back to some of the other slides. We have notes and, and just to be to be fair to the public and we didn't know that you intended to do this, so we intended to conclude with this. We have, we have notes underneath each element as to whether or not we comply and if not, what the deviation is. So, so we're happy to respond to those in due course as you raise them. So, sure. um, so absolutely. So there you go. The floor is yours. So the intent in doing this is to be as clear as we possibly can to walk through each item on the guidelines, discuss their merits, any comments that the committee may have, any additional comments that we'll provide to the developer, and we'll move on to the next one. As I said, today is for discussion only. No formal recommendations will be made. So let's jump into this. Um, parkway character and protection. Um, I'd like to open up for comment to the committee. Or, or I can start. Does anybody have any comments? If not, I can, I can throw a few comments. I'll get this thing going. All right, looks like it's me. Um, I do have a little bit of a concern on the, um, the loading dock along uh, Lyons and its setback. It's a compliance with the setbacks. We'll just need to make, confirm that to make sure that we're in full compliance there. Um, and as we move down, um, there is some talk about the parkway and widening of the roadway. Can we go to the next slide, please? So I'd like to um, have a little bit of discussion with, with our committee here about 
the potential widening of the roadway, although it being in a, a small portion to accommodate the proposed roundabout, as well as kind of where we stand with the discussions on the roundabout. I know we just had a whole lot of discussion about traffic, but we really didn't talk about the status of, of the roundabout, the comments, preliminary comments from Rhode Island DOT, and kind of where we are in that process and what the timing of that is, because that, that's ultimately going to affect the project moving forward. So I'm going to bring Mr. Bannon back up to speak about the status of the dialogue with DOT. But just in response to your first um, element with regard to the, to the roadway widening, just so, and so this is one of the few elements of design guidelines in which there is there's deviation from the guidelines to some extent. Now, to be clear, in 2005, um, the city put forth a improvement plan for this intersection that contemplated a roundabout. That roundabout necessarily involved a certain amount of widening. So under, even though the design guidelines um, discourage them, under the traffic improvement that the city itself recommended in connection with previously contemplated development on one side of the parkway, they had proposed a roundabout. We now have development on the other side, on the Metacomet side of the parkway. And there also remains the very distinct possibility of that same development taking place or some ver version of it taking place on the opposite side of the parkway. So that concept or the, the premise of the 2005 recommendation remains intact, that a roundabout of some width is going to be required. So we freely admit that the, we do not comply with that element of the guidelines, but we think that the city itself initially um, contemplated a, a limited widening. And as and Mr. Bannon can go into this as well if you want, if he so prefers, but the widening that's contemplated is limited in scope. So it only extends upon the, the least amount of area possible to accommodate the increased traffic before it reverts to its its customary width. So, so we acknowledge that this is an element that that is um, inconsistent with the guidelines to some extent, and we believe it's, up, however, it is consistent with the city's plan for, for this intersection previously. Now, Mr. Bannon can speak to, to where things stand with DOT. Okay. Um, we've presented our report, design study report, and this plan to the Department of Transportation as part of what we call a preliminary physical alteration, so we can get a buy-off from them, as I had previously mentioned. Back in uh, 2005, when I was involved uh, in village on the waterfront, um, we came up with a conceptual design. At that time, it was a single-lane roundabout, um, but that during that review process, they felt it needed to be a two lane back then. Um, so that project um, was halted, so that design was not uh, advanced. So knowing that those traffic volumes have, have been reduced slightly since that period um, with our additional traffic, uh, it will require a two lane roundabout, which um, will operate very efficiently, um, as demonstrated in our study, uh, the Department of Transportation <clears throat> feels it's the appropriate design, um, and we will be obtaining a letter from them that will allow us to advance the full application. Thank you. Yeah, can you speak to the microphone for the Paul? I do have two questions for you. One, you made reference with the roundabout that you will not be able to take a left-hand turn from the development. Correct. You'll be going to the roundabout to make that turn. Are you permitted, if you are on the parkway, to make a left-hand turn into the main drive of the development, or do you also do that from the roundabout? No, we feel that it's important that um, that left turn be provided off the parkway, um, just for long-term potential of that waterfront across the street. And is there so, a provision of a turning lane or something that provides, yes, provides a safe stop? It, it, it's, it's a separate turn lane, and that's part of the, 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 the widening that's required. And we've done that also. We've provided a separate turn lane. Um, we could have narrowed it down sooner, but we wanted to provide a separate turn lane into the office park. Um, today, you know, I had designed the improvements further to the south that made it a safer situation where people had a, a refuge lane to turn into the side streets and, and, and 
Kettle Point. Um, that was a major safety enhancement along that section of road. One other question for you about the, the roundabout. Um, in one of the earlier uh, landscape plans, you discussed that that was um, going to be the connection point for the bike path from this development. How does someone navigate crossing the roundabout with a bike? Because there's not going to actually be a stop. No, it's, it's yield controlled. Um, it's a, a standard design. Um, you know, you can see it here. Uh, um, this is in, in Appenog. Uh, you can see the pedestrian. No, no that doesn't work. Uh, you can see the uh, pedestrian crosswalks um, on the approaches and on the exit to the roundabout, if you look on the right-hand side, um, the typical design is you have one car space at the yield line, and then the, then the um, crosswalk. It's a, it's a standard design, and, and people have slowing to yield. Um, we'll also work to determine if, if uh, high visibility uh, signage uh, is necessary, if you have a flashing um, sign that would alert motorists that someone is there and wanting to cross. Um, but again, speeds are designed to be low and that's what the uh, roundabout itself is. It's diverting uh, the, the rate, the, the turn of the vehicle at, at a certain path through the roundabout. It requires a certain speed and that's the design uh, element, one of the design elements of a roundabout. Thank you. Uh, one, one comment to go along with that. Um, not only do we need to get Rhode Island DOT on board, we need to make sure that uh, we're in compliance with the Scenic Highway Commission. Yes, I've know, worked with we will be Scenic Roadways Board, and that's one of the we will be infringing on their property. Randy on board. Um, he worked um, back in the 90s on the stewardship plan for the Scenic Roadways Board, so he's highly familiar with the parkway uh, and its characteristics, its history, and requirements. There have been a lot of comments regarding the, the historic nature and, and the scenic highways board. So we want to make sure that we uh, go through all the steps that we can to ensure that we're in compliance. Um, and as well as our IDOT needs to be on board to make sure that this in fact is the appropriate solution for the city of East Providence and, and this project and make sure that we have a complete, uh, a complete documented process so that we can present that here. Yes, and, and uh, again, as part of that preliminary physical alteration permit process, we hope to obtain a letter from them that saying they agree in concept with what we're proposing, uh, submit formal design plans uh, for review and approval. So especially on a project like this, I worked on a number of large states throughout the state. Before you invest in, in them, you want to make sure that they're on board. Thank you. Uh, one question I have regarding roundabouts in general. Uh, I see the one that, that's been instituted over at the Henderson Bridge. And uh, I don't know how many people have, uh, have uh, gone through that, but it feels congested. And I wonder if it's the, if it's the diameter of it that's an issue. And I look okay. here and I, I can see two issues. First, uh, that the diameter be sufficient, obviously, but also to take into account that we know at some point down the line, the Chevron property is going to be developed. And this roundabout, if it goes through, and I think it should, uh, is going to accommodate that too. So the size of this roundabout should not be too small and congested. No. It should and be certainly large enough to accommodate. Correct. The and ability that's... to see somebody coming from, you know, 30 or 40 yards away or something like that. Um, yes, it'll be, it'll be similar in size to, to this roundabout. If if you look up there, yes, they they are varying, but um, I think the inscribed circle is like 180. So it'll it'll be a much larger than, than that one. That one's restricted now because it's not fully constructed, so it it feels that way. Uh, <laughs> typically, uh, they'll design roundabouts for the traffic today, um, but they'll allow them. Um, easy adjustments for future growth where if it's a single lane they can cut back the island splitter island get two lanes in and, 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 
the entry in, in the circulator. So it's designed for two lanes, but it's only one lane for that. So that allow an easy transition to from which okay. one leads. The other thing is I noticed that we're not going to have tra traffic signaling. I, I mean, uh, that's apparently uh, lit uh, signals, et cetera. But there will be stop signs or yield signs as yes. necessary. Yeah. It, it'll, be, it'll meet the manual on uniform traffic control devices for, for proper signage and control. So okay. you'll have lane use signs that let you know, you know when you're on the circle which um, lane you need to be in to make it safe. Thank you. Any other commission have some comments? Just really quick, Mr. Chair, on the setback question on the grocery, uh, we the minimum is 15 feet along that road. We're 50 feet back to the edge of the building, and 30 feet back to the edge of paving there. So we've got room for buffer. The, the building is set down a bit, so we'll have a planted slope there that sits down a bit lower than than line Avenue. And, and that'll be documented on the drawings. So that is in the drawings. Okay, absolutely. great. Thank you. Yep. I just had a question on the uh, the rotary on the next page. That involves uh, additional land that'll have to be acquired in order to is the additional land public or private? Acquired. It is privately held. Side. It is on the Metacomet Office Park property, and then um, what we call the former Chevron property on the other side. That um, and we've been in touch with both property owners. They're aware of the of the um, proposal. And we've had tentatively positive discussions. And, and obviously, as this application progresses, we understand that that uh, there have to be sufficient property within which to construct a roundabout. So, and, and especially as it relates to um, the neighbors on the other side of the parkway, regardless of what they put up there, what they ultimately go forward with, there has to be a roundabout because there's no access. So, so it's inevitable that there is going to necessarily be um, two-way access on and off that part of the parkway um, due to both the develop, uh, development on the Metacomet site as well as the long dormant development on the other side. Uh, just a question on, on the existing traffic conditions. Uh, Paul mentioned there's 16, 18,000 calls per day, current conditions. That's how it's varied over the last 20 plus years. Today, uh, with current post COVID conditions, it's roughly 16,500. And the proposed, I guess, development projection is in what range? Estimate? Well, because we're a destination, um, the traffic generated by this site will be split. Um, so, daily traffic, we would estimate roughly 11,000 trips, but that could be. 3,000, 5,000. So, like with the parkway, that 16,000 today is is through traffic pretty much. Um, so, we're a destination, so it's going to be split. Um, so, you're not going to see that on the on the full parkway. So 11,000 into the facility. Total in and out. Yes. Yeah. Top of the point. Yes. And what you see today, um, you know, post COVID, the, the peaks. Um, that used to be, you know, your commute of 7 to 9 a.m., uh, 4 to 6 p.m. periods. Um, those peaks are less, and people go to work later, come home, or, you know, they, they've adjusted their schedule um, post-COVID. So you'll have higher volumes during, a little higher volumes during the midday period than you would unless during the, the peak hour. Um, you know, our morning peak is pretty much associated with the residential component. Um, the higher volumes uh, are associated with the commercial component. So uh, you mentioned lion of a thousand trips a day. Yes. Uh, any idea what the implications are? Um, we're trying to limit the the impact on lion and focusing that traffic towards the parkway. Um, so you know that short section of, of road is going to. Uh, probably be three, four thousand vehicles per day um, handled through the through the roundabout. Um, we're going to be working with the city on uh, providing measures to limit um, cut through traffic from the neighborhood. Um, we can do things along Mercer uh, and Fort uh, to make uh, traffic calming measures to and and 
regulatory measures uh, that would mitigate um, you know, cut through traffic and use of that. We're trying to focus it, well, most of the traffic uh, to the parkway. And with the added commercial uh, component to the improvement, uh, what expect we can do in the future to are, do it, are doable for the next few years, considering the, the weight limits on the uh, cutting edge? Well, the trucks are allowed on the parkway to service businesses along the parkway. Through truck traffic is not allowed on the parkway. Um, we would have to work with the Grossa on, you know, the, 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 they would be the biggest uh, use. I don't know if you get one or two uh, trucks a day. Um, we would have to coordinate that with them once we know who it is um, to understand that. But we've designed the um, access and circulation to accommodate that, those types of vehicles. So question for Dan, I know there's a weight limit on the parkway, especially at the South Broadway culvert. Do you have an idea of what is on that one? What the weight limit is yeah. on that? I think two ton. Probably could an eighteen wheeler drive down the parkway to get to this development? Could could one drive down? Yeah, they could if it was for a local delivery. For a local delivery, they could not cut through the parkway, but they could access uh, the development if it was for a delivery. So it would be on a because most of the stores will take smaller deliveries. It, it would. It's more for the big box store that we're talking about here. That would and, be, and that would be more oriented towards the freeway. So, so we do have a plan, or you do have a plan in place to at least address, you know, the ability for the trucks to, to deliver to the big box store. Yes. Okay. I guess the city would have to watch the weight limit on the culvert as well. Right. Um, I don't know if it's, I think that's appropriate. Um, there are a few other places in the guidelines as we step through them that do touch on the memo that was prepared. But if you'd like to step up and give us an overview of, of, the, uh, of the memo, we can then incorporate those comments into our discussion going forward. Uh, James Moran, uh, Chief uh, Planner for the Planning Department. Um, as part of our review process, the Planning Department was um, uh, responsible for providing a report to the Executive Director, Raymond Wavy, and uh, we had prepared this report um, on um, March 18th, going back. And a number of things were identified. The transportation system was, you know, probably the biggest um, issue that was discussed within the memo. We had talked about um, the Rhode Island Department of Transportation was still in the process at that time of reviewing it. And it's my understanding, and I've actually seen a letter from RIDOT that provided some recommendations on how that, that roundabout could be improved. Um, in that memo, we also identified that there were concerns related to the number of traffic, um, um, the, the amount of traffic that would be added to the Vets Parkway, which the VNAS study indicated was 11,000 vehicles per day. and so. While this uh, memorandum didn't provide any specific recommendation at that time, we did express concerns relating the impacts that those traffic um, numbers could have on the area. That being said, it is understood that the waterfront was rezoned to allow these types of uses. And so it becomes an issue of, you know, the balance of creating a development that's a positive impact for the community, but also making sure that the transportation impacts are are mitigated as much as they can be. And so I think that was our biggest concern when we were writing this memorandum at the time. There were certainly other concerns relating to other issues, but I think transportation was certainly one of the most uh, critical. But if there's any, I, that memo was provided previously, and if there are any questions, I can go into the specifics if there are any specific questions that you have in uh, from the memo. Since, the, uh, since your memo, your memo Yes, there were two peer reviews that were provided by PAR. One was the uh, drainage analysis peer review that was uh, prepared by PAR. And then the second was a transportation peer review that provided a number of comments. That peer review um, indicated that the, um, 
the report was prepared properly, that they followed the standards for a correct, uh, correctly uh, using the right standards for the preparation of a transportation um, study. I know there have been discussions regarding the Crossman study, and um, there have been some concerns that have been expressed by the members of the public that uh, the Crossman study perhaps wasn't referenced uh, in terms of the review process. I'm reaching out to um, PAR to have them um, do an update and take a look at that Crossman study and provide some additional information on that. But from the Vanass study standpoint, they indicated that the study was prepared properly. They did provide some comments. Paul Bannon had mentioned that the um, of those comments that were provided, technical comments primarily, and that the uh, the developer was going to be uh, uh, preparing uh, modifications to the plan to reflect those uh, those comments. There were also comments from DOT on the roundabout that required some modifications that they requested as well, and I imagine they're taking care of that right now. But again, the Crossman study, I will be speaking with them so that by the time the full commission meets, we'll be able to provide an update on that, that additional Crossman information and the peer review there. Well, <laughs> I just want to point out one, one element about the 11,000 trips, which, um, just to be clear, that is upon the completion of the development, which has a 10-year build-out. So there's obviously phasing that we discussed and that Matt went over previously. So, um, you know, it's, it's obviously going to have significantly fewer trips as the development is solely brought online, meaning that initial commercial, the initial residential, then the majority of the residential in phase two so, you know, by no means am I looking to minimize that there will be additional traffic on Veterans Memorial Parkway or the trips in general. But just to be clear, we're talking about at the end of the development, assuming full build out, 11,000 additional trips. It's not as if in two years that you're going to see that many cars as a result of this development. Now I have to go back to my stuff. So, so I'm sorry, quick question. So when would the roundabout be built in the 10 year? Or... Um, part of the initial development process. So, so the roundabout has to go first in order to access, excuse me, properly access the commercial that's contemplated in phase one. So, so that's a very good question. We're not looking to um, get out from under that obligation. There's no way that phase one of the improvements works without that roundabout being in place. Just one last question. The curb cut on the parkway uh, that moving the entrance down south, I guess, that also requires DOT. I believe that requires, so that'll be part of our physical alteration permit, and it also will require scenic roadway approval because you're moving an entrance on a scenic roadway. So it'll be, I, to be candid, I don't know if it'll get the same degree of attention, nor should it, as the roundabout does, which is obviously a, a heightened engineering concern, but, but simply because you're proposing um, a modification of an existing access way, you have to go through scenic roadways as well. Thank you. One more question. Would the roundabout be built by your team or would that be DOT doing construction? That would be our team. And I think I would add that um, the Rhode Island Department of Transportation in their comment letter indicated that the developer should hire a firm that specializes in the design of roundabouts. So an engineer that is uh, specifically uh, skilled in that particular design area. And, and if you look at what Federal Highway Administration is doing these days, they are looking very much at you know, building more um, roundabouts to reduce fatalities. One of the things that's nice about a roundabout is that it helps to um, reduce major accidents and, 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 and deaths. It, it, you tend to see more low speed accidents, which are unfortunate, but you don't see the loss of life usually in those situations. So that's what a lot of it's being done from the federal highways perspective and looking at these. I would also note that I think the location of that roundabout, if you're familiar with the Vets Parkway at that location, cars go by there anywhere from 40 to 60 miles an hour, depending on um, <laughs> what speed they're going at. But I think a roundabout from a standpoint of slowing traffic down, it does have that impact as well. So. Not to say that I'm, you know, immediately we're not endorsing 
you know, completely a roundabout from the situation, but, but from the standpoint of the, what they do and how they accomplish uh, the task from a standpoint of that versus a, a traffic light, I think, you know, a roundabout is a much more uh, uh, sensible um, option for that location. So this project kind of being the, the first project that is going to be affected by this roundabout, it's, it's good to hear that there's been discussion about how this roundabout is going to affect future projects. The, the, plot, the uh, parcel across the street. Correct. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing we've talked about, too, is that eventually Rhode Island Waterfront Enterprises will be approaching the Waterfront Commission for development at that location, too. And uh, I think in previous discussions we've had with the developer, we've indicated that they should have, you know, ongoing discussions with them in terms of what their plans are for making connections to that roundabout, which will, you know, certainly be the most sensible option to connect at that location. So. And then the ability to build waterfront drive, which would come up from below and potentially connect at that location. And so I think the developers indicated they're having conversations with, uh, with them to talk about those issues. It, it'll reflect all development on the, on the parkway here. You know, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to impact up and down the parkway in both directions. So it's, it's good to, to know that we're talking at a much larger scale beyond just the project that's in front of us. Thank you. Let's ask one question. for additional roundabout beginning upper veterans and lower um there's nothing at all being discussed outside of this roundabout there is modifications to the broadway um but those are just modifications to the turn not really a new roundabout so that's the only one that's being proposed at this time but, uh, i know it's not uh, a question about uh, it's not regarding the parkway but Consideration of sidewalks on Lion Avenue at all, crosswalks in particular fields. Sorry, better? Okay. <laughs> we are proposing a crosswalk at that pocket park uh, adjacent to our entry offline that would get you up to uh, Jordan's Pond and the Pierce uh, Field. Um, as far as sidewalks on Lion Ave, we are providing it along the frontage uh, up to the point where we donated that land to the city. Um, and at that point, uh, that there's ability to put walks on there. We've not contemplated one, uh, but that is that nine acres is available for uh, whatever needs to go there. But we are you can see the arrows uh, right in the center of the block. That's where we intend to uh, connect across to uh, the existing sort of trail network across the street. And you mentioned the sidewalk would be from uh, Lion. Uh, from the it's like Fort Street uh, toward uh, the Parkway, uh, on the uh, from from the Pocket Park essentially to the Parkway, we are proposing a sidewalk. That red dash line that goes behind the big box store. That's correct. From the circle there to the to the to the roundabout. That's right. Yeah. I know. I notice in this uh, in this diagram you have uh, the pedestrian traffic going in through and walking around. Uh, nothing going to Fort Street. There's a particular reason you don't want to go to Fort Street. You see, I know that uh, that that uh, driveway, that um, road there, is an emer emergency only. But that's right. You prefer not to have pedestrian traffic too coming from Fort. I I don't think we would be against it, but we've we've tried to keep any you know real significant uh, access to Fort. Uh, limited to that emergency access and just to driveway, essentially, for the uh, maintenance building. Otherwise, uh, we're, we're not proposing um, connections uh, through into that area. Matt, if I could add, the yes. um, trail access you have shown on the southwest side um, that you're, I think you're calling out as access to Jones Pond. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but that is Rhode Island Energy property. Um, so that's 
likely not a feasible option. It's looking at the city's GIS. So I think there should be some consideration some consideration brought to extending sidewalks further north to allow access into Pierce Field, um, you know, on the city's property. So I can't imagine that Rhode Island Energy would want uh, public crossing through that. So where the N is in Lyon, sort yeah. of towards that direction, then we'd be across so from city. The property. N is within city property. Right. Um, that rectangular shaped parcel is owned by the uh, bar that's there now. Yep. Um, and the parcel further south that's sort of uh, the two squares is yep. uh, Narragansett Electric or Rhode Island Energy's property. I think that makes good sense. We can coordinate that with you um, yep. and make sure that's in the right spot. Thank you. Um, so in the sorry. Oh, no. in the area that belongs to the city in the top right, uh, it, it, along that edge uh, going into the uh, Metacomet area, uh, you've got foliage all along the barrier in between the trees, uh, which is fine. It looks it'll look beautiful. Uh, do you have any other barrier? Do you have fencing there, or is it just full act, you know, open access between? Between the city property, between the, 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 the senior this. living area and the city property, right? That's a vegetated buffer. We we hadn't uh, proposed a, a physical barrier beyond that, um, but we, you know, we we think that that'll that'll work fine. We're connected to open space all over mm -hmm. uh, in that, um, you know, surrounding our entire development. So uh, we don't we don't see that as an issue. Okay. <clears throat> see, my question kind of piggybacks on Dave's question. And it's it's for Jim. Has the city does the city have any plans or concepts of the development of that piece of land on the corner? No, the only thing we've kind of discussed was that it would be a very likely a passive recreation um, property that it would probably have walking paths, you know, green areas for people to sit and to, you know, eat lunch or relax. And that's kind of what we thought of at this point. But I think because this project is phased the way it is, there's, there's an opportunity that when the city does come to an understanding of what that property is going to be used for, I think we'll have the, the, the developer will have the opportunity to make a better incorporation of that property with this property and, and treat it appropriately so that we get a proper, a proper uh, vegetative break. You know, we get um, circulation. Maybe that's where we get our access to Fort Street. Um, and all of those items start to happen in, in that piece. We don't see them now because it, because it's actually a good thing that you are phasing it for that particular piece that gives a little bit more time for the city to kind of get an understanding of how they want to use that property and how it's going to interact with the development. It can be tied together cohesively in a way that makes the most sense. Absolutely. And there are some important um, trees that are located on that property too that the city would, you know, look to retain those as a sycamore that's quite impressive there, and several other trees that we'd be very uh, interested in retaining as part of that park space that would be in there. This kind of just uh, segues into the next section of the guidelines, which is sidewalks, bike paths, safety crossings. Um, so, and I'm thankful that you put the slide up there because I was going to ask it to do anyway. Um, so I'd like to get some comments from the committee regarding um, paths and sidewalks. That slide? Oh, you want to keep, oh, I thought you wanted the guidelines. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think it would be good to hear from Sarah. Uh, you know, our landscape doctor. I'm, I'm glad you have this particular slide out because I think this is where we need some explanation of a pedestrian system that responds to the, the unique, unique characters of this site. The pedestrian system we see here, there are a lot of the, well, I'm not sure I can give you a percentage, but is meant a, a lot of the pedestrian system really is going through parking lots or along parking lots and not really responding to some of the wonderful aspects of the site. And I think we, that's something I hope you'll, you'll address. The other thing, although not sidewalks, but we're in the same item here is bike paths. And I would like you to talk about how a cyclist on site or what accommodations you have for a bicyclist on site who is moving from any of the residential buildings through the site or, or off to the bike path. 
Uh, thank you, Sarah. We have um, provided for, in terms of bikes, I'll start there. We've, we've got bike racks uh, located throughout the development, um, which you'll see probably not so much at this scale, but if you go to the, uh, the blow-up sheets that are within the package, uh, you, you can identify where those are. Um, in terms of accommodation, uh, we've got the internal roadway network uh, we've got connections to, as I mentioned, to the um, to the roundabout for access to the bike path. We don't have a sort of uh, bike only uh, network uh, within the site, but uh, we do have uh, you know wide enough roadway that 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 can be shared. Uh, and then, in terms of your your first point about um, where are the pathways that are kind of keeping in character, we we really see that hundred foot buffer along Veterans Memorial as almost a, a park space that there will be a path meandering through that and connecting down uh, along that 100 foot buffer to the sort of amenity area uh, at the lower corner there, the amphitheater, there's a tent space, there's that promenade. Uh, so that that is really kind of a park like setting sort of away from the parking away from the internal uh, roadway network. And I, I take your point that there, there are a lot of sidewalks adjacent to, uh, to parking and buildings within the site, uh, just by kind of the nature of, of the way the development lays out. But we, we have tried to uh, improve uh, that pedestrian experience in sort of the pocket park and the buffering at the edges, and particularly along Veterans Memorial. Uh, that really, that's a 100 feet is, you know, pretty decent width to uh, to have kind of a, a green zone that I think will be effective in keeping in character with, uh, with the Veterans Memorial. I, I think Sarah's right, and maybe part of the problem is actually traffic. Because mm -hmm. uh, I agree, but that 100 foot buffer. Sort of gets lost at this scale. Well, okay. And, you know, even back at That really <laughs> indicates from the crossing at seven is a way to get to all of this quote unquote public fun stuff. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you just really one graphically indicate it, but mm -hmm. also just think about how does a bicycle interact with the bicycle? Bicycles and pedestrians don't always yeah. play nicely together. There's actually enough room in that 100, 100 foot buffer to probably put a bike path and, and a pedestrian path, maybe separate them out. But if you did that, you'd take up a lot of the valuable green space. At I, 100 feet, yeah. narrowly six it, feet wide. It's one that needs discussion. It, We've it's a, it's done a difficult sort of one. shared use paths, yeah. too, that are kind of wide enough and striped appropriately so that I, you can keep those uses. I think uh, that separate. can work within. The setback area. I'm more concerned about bicyclists in, within the the main part of the uh, development itself. That they they can't be on the sidewalk. Sidewalks aren't wide enough. So they they'll have to be in the shoulders. Um, I'm assuming there's no parking on any of those roads. Um, but that hasn't been spoken about. Um, so You're correct. We You're we right have there. we. I think there's still some conflicts there to be resolved. And in terms of Kind of what it feels like to be a pedestrian. Uh, you're new, or new to me anyway. Some of the uh, uh, renderings that you have are really very helpful, but they're not in November and they're not in February. And I think we've got some different things that have to be dealt with here. There also were a few questions from the public in the previous comments regarding um, access to the rest of the site, the golf course, et cetera. So I know. It's probably not the best idea because of danger of golf balls and people being hit. But have you thought at all about being able to do stuff around the fringes, um, be able to get some more of that pedestrian in embracing the, the, the layout of the land and, and maybe get some paths in there that, while protected, you know, people might be able to kind of circulate around without getting hit by a golf ball? We've, we've talked about that. Um, that. That is a tricky area to, to invite people there that aren't playing golf. Uh, the course is open to the public. Uh, it will be 
you know, available for people to, to utilize, but uh, we've really not contemplated having a, um, a dedicated pedestrian travel way through, through that course because of the, the danger aspect. Just wanted to bring it up to see if you had thought about it. It was a comment that came up in previous meetings. Um, it looks like you can kind of skirt along the edges there, um, up behind the, uh, the golf building, and it looks like your path can kind of circulate down and around. It looks like you've made an effort. It's just, I, I agree, shouldn't have access through the golf course, but just keep it open to around the fringes and see if there's any opportunities there. And that'll help with the meandering idea of embracing the site and walking through and and you know trying to respect both both uh views on that and be safe as i look at and think about you know, bicyclists getting from one side to the other uh you have the uh the, the crosswalk for them or the cross path for them uh adjacent to the um uh, the roundabout uh people coming out of a roundabout are anxious to get out of it and find out and get on their way uh, so they might be in a bit of a hurry. Uh, my only thought is to consider having the uh, the cross uh, for the bicyclists further away from the roundabout, so that people are just in the way you would have a just a typical crosswalk for pedestrians or anything else, stop for pedestrians, et cetera, uh, but not so close to the roundabout where all that activity is going on, 360 degrees. It's it's a thought just to consider. I understood. Um, I think. I'll defer to uh, to Paul Bannon on that, just from a safety standpoint. Um, there there are some key standards that I'm sure they're trying to adhere to, but your, your point's well taken. It's a, a way to make it uh, easier on folks crossing, certainly. Any other comments? Or we'll move to view corridors. Good. Okay. Um, Sarah, I know you had some comments in your in your uh, memo regarding view corridors, if you don't mind sharing those. I'm not sure I was specifically on view corridors, but I would think that um, Paul mentioned that he was concerned about context, uh, context sensitive layout of the roadway. And I think in general, the, the roadways within the site need to have that as well. And I was a little surprised at the formality of the I don't know what we call it, the, the entrance road from Lyon uh, in a very strict linear um, pattern rather than the things that might have gone with the Blackstone, Bull, with sorry, not Blackstone, <coughs> Veterans Memorial Parkway or an Olmstedian Parkway of any sort uh, would have had a, a, a little more flowing sort of a, uh, a layout. And if, with that sort of in mind also the road that particular set of roadway is divided highway or divided roadway with a median strip um if i took that median strip out and maybe took a little more uh land from some other maybe to the uh east i might be able to increase the parking lot on the east side of the um of the grocery store and take away the the line of parking on the south side of it and so to, so I wouldn't have quite such an intense parking lot feeling along the uh, the central axial road if that makes any sense and it now probably could, doesn't could we share the of, you. Of, the, of that road while Sarah's talking that's okay oh, okay I don't know if I can get it. But can you put it here? <laughs> um, this road was yes. up to Lyon that I was concerned about that's a, just a different style from anything that we have on on this sort of a parkway. And you've, you've changed styles intentionally, and I think that's something that needs to be addressed. It may be right, may be wrong, but it is, it is different. Uh, and if that road were then narrowed a bit, I might be able to get another level of parking there and to, 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 to put, uh, and take yes. away a line of parking in there. And I know it's, it's tough because you need the parking and Space is limited, but I think some of those things need to be relooked at. It might also mean moving the road, the uh, uh, fountain roundabout, a little further down, and making it possible to have the whole sense of that entrance going down toward the golf course again. This this is my 
this is a difficult way to end such a formal act as part and in the amphitheater or a view into the part into the golf course in some way or, or I don't have an answer but I think things that I wish that that uh, could have more conversation okay. okay any other comments this really had a I know there was a rending at one time selling the uh, view of the development on the parkway and you know I don't know if Glenn if you have any if you have any comments in terms of driving on the parkway, approaching it, uh, driving towards Providence, so how, how that changed. I, I think at this point, because of the preliminary plans that they've developed, that they've made a good effort with the relative the grocery store. I was going to talk about it later. Um, or we can have a little sidebar. I've got a friend who might be extremely good. I think they've done a good job from minimizing the scale. I think ultimately, once the, the big box store is decided who it's going to be. There's, there's a lot of potential to, um, I don't know, fenestrate that back, you know, make sure it looks appropriate. You know, there's an, and there's opportunities depending on what type of store you have that you might not have to pursue as much of a glazing variance as well, depending on what the store is and how it's laid out, the size of it, the shape of it. I mean, right now without a store, you're just kind of making an assumption on the size and shape of the building. Just for clarity, it will be a grocery. You know, any big box user, like the typical categories that you'd see at Target or at you know, Walmart, it's a, it's a grocery. So uh, I just want that to be clear just so nobody has any misconceptions about what we're planning for there. But you're right. Once there's a, a tenant, there'll probably be some modifications and tweaking that we'll need to do uh, regardless of, of who it is, uh, which grocer it is. Um, and, and certainly up for relooking at some of those relationships that you just described. I think the, um, the terminus of the, uh, the roundabout sort of morphing into that town center space, that's really where we go from vehicular to changing it to pedestrian. Um, and, and the angle is, is really intentional. That's where it, it starts to follow uh, the angle of Veterans Memorial and, and sort of everything is laid out off of that, you know, as an offset of that axis, uh, the, the driveway coming down off Lyon, um, that, that might be where there's some opportunity to, to wiggle it a little bit or, or make some modifications to um, eliminate some of the, the parking, as you suggest, to make more of a boulevard green out of that, that roadway there. Uh, but we're, we'll certainly take a look at that. Thank you. I, I had one question. Uh, I know that the, one of the one of the issues in the design guidelines and is the uh, one of the trees you had mentioned within the development, the, the removal and replacement of an existing tree within the buffer, which is a hundred foot buffer. Those existing trees will will remain. Those will remain. Yes. So those are large. Trees, so That's right. Helping them out. Those were plan. indicated on that plan as to remain. So many of what you will see custom bordering the parkway right. may not need to be. We'll need to do some cleaning up and some, some pruning, and uh, but, but the intent is to leave all those mature trees and actually augment them with additional vegetation within that design to make that feel very. Any other comments? Um, but I do want to reiterate to um, your efforts on trying to shield the buildings, uh, the building view from the parkway. Um, with the trees that, that Bill just discussed, as well as the, the impl impl implementation of additional trees, 
we just can't see that particular slide right now. Um, and the and the renderings, I, I think they've you've done a good job of trying to maintain the visual aspect of the parking lot. I mean, of the parkway. Let's move along to lighting and signage. Um, I can start this off. I did appreciate the foot calc um, information that was put on the drawings. Um, it appears that there's almost no light spillage off the site. A couple of small areas where it's really, really light, like right behind the, um, the loading dock, but it's like 0.1, you know, at the corner it's 0.1. So um, it does show that the light is is internally focused on, on the property. And um, I do appreciate your efforts. I think that um, ultimately um, in the final, um, in the, in the final, recommendations for the project. We'd like to see maybe some um, some actual physical shots of the of the light fixtures just so that we can get an understanding and the public can see the type of light fixture, how it operates and and how it's going to be um, perceived on the site. Um, you have made, like I said, you have made an effort to to keep the light within the parkway. I mean, I'm sorry, within the project uh, zone. And we appreciate that, or I appreciate that. I didn't want to speak for anyone else. <laughs> and, and in terms of signage, I think the applicant is going to need to come up with a sign that great mark signage of that type. And I think in our guidelines, I think has been mentioned as the type of sign on the. Sure. So um, I believe you're uh, seeking, you'll be seeking some relief for this proposed sign that's on the parkway uh, because obviously it's uh, not consistent with the guidelines or I believe seen it my way. So that, that is our intent. The application, briefly on that, the application requirements for waterfront submission state that if you do not comply in all respects with the um, zoning requirements or design requirements of the Waterfront Commission, you are supposed to identify the variances that you um, that you request. So in the narrative that's accompanied the application, so we, we have a plan that shows like setbacks and everything like that on the submission, right? So you can see in all material respects from a dimensional standpoint, there's compliance, but we have affirmatively identified the three variances that we request, which is what the application requires, which is the fenestration requirement, a minimal parking variance, as well as the signage on Veterans Memorial Parkway, which we are prepared to speak about before the hearing panel which obviously we can't um, commence until a design review has made its record. Okay, great. Yeah, but I just wanted to note that that's something that will uh, require another hearing. Correct. That's right. Correct. Any other comments on this topic? And on signage, will the grocery store sign be viewable from Veterans Memorial? There'll be a, yeah. there'll be a large sign on. There will be a sign on the grocery store. I think it was in some of the rendering. Yes. So, so both the signage that would be the subject of the variance that Josh was speaking about. So the signage on the parkway would have a sign that announces who the grocery store would be. But the, the building itself, we're also proposing. It's only like 40 questions now. I don't know if you'd see that sign directly from the parkway. There's, there's a lot of buildings and et cetera in front of it. So I don't, I, if you're looking like if you're at the bottom of the, the cove there, looking up, I don't think we'll see like, you know, Bob's or whatever. Um, whatever. So here's the view entering from Lyon Avenue, looking into the development. So on the, on the left side here, we anticipate a, a sign on the grocery store. And this is not quite from eye level either. Air, right? So it's a little higher than a car. Right. Okay. Great. So from the from the proposed rotary, you know, in the distance there, you'd see a grocery store. There would would be a proposed sign on the side of it. And that shot's internal to the site, right? That's it's, from the rotary. Yeah. Well, that's from the new rotary. From the rotary. Okay. Looking. So you will you will see it from the upper, but probably not the lower. But the other entrance doesn't have a sign that there wouldn't be a ladder sign, for instance, or the other businesses. So you can see in this view just past the rotary, there is a monument sign there. 
that would announce the grocery store, but also have some some placards for the additional uh, retail pieces of the property. So we're proposing one sign here at the Rotary and one sign at the vehicular entry off of Veterans Memorial Park. Go back to there. There's one view of, of the one with the further south entrance. And now those signs slides, wouldn't be, There's the sign on the left side of this rendering here. But, but those signs wouldn't be internally eliminated. They'd be either a halo or a... Correct. Right. We, we propose a, a halo effect lighting or, or externally lit. Right. As it relates to the uh, lighting, has there been any further discussion as to whether or not the city will um, take ownership of some of the utilities? Um, you know, as it relates to lighting, but obviously also, um, you know, sewer water. There have been no further discussions of late. While we're talking about signage, I guess we can talk about the name, which I've brought up before. How I so much appreciate the name Metacomet, which is historical, which is means something to East Providence residents, but also to the history of Rhode Island, uh, and the rather trite idea of shortening it to Met, as if we would shorten um, the Rockefeller Center to the Rock. I think that would be unfair, so I just as soon stick with Meta Comet for the name of this development, because I think it's rather dignified. I, I have to second that when I first, I, I knew why it was met, but again, I think of Matt Kessler and the, the bright things, and again. Yep. No, we had a, we had a lengthy discussion about this at, a, um, at maybe at the first Waterfront Commission hearing, and we, we've engaged with, uh, with branding Consultants were working on that. This is a placeholder. We don't want to uh, alarm anyone that that's going to be permanent. We've not changed all the renderings since then to, um, to adjust for that, but we'll we'll keep working on that and, and get back to you with more information. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to uh, green space, open protected area. Sarah, do you have any comments on this? I think there's a, going to need to be a fair amount of discussion about the, tr the plant material that's proposed. Um, item five says all trees should be species native to Rhode Island. Um, even the term native, uh, various people define it different ways. Is it, is it a, 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 a plant that was here at, at time of coloniz colonization? Um, in this particular area of Rhode Island? Um, does this include cultivars and hybrids and various other sorts of things? I think you'd be hard put to be strictly uh, defining native and, and make this work, um, it, particularly on, on your evergreen species. Um, so I think the working with the, the City Tree Commission will, will be absolutely essential to, to figure out how this can work. Because um, a tree living in a parking lot at a parking island doesn't have the same advantages as one that was growing in the forest or whatever. Um, and so we really have to be concerned about uh, context and a number of different things. Also, I think it would be of interest to know if there are any planting plans from the parkway from the Olmsted firm uh, when it was Barrington Parkway at that point. It, it changed its name somewhere along the way. Um, because of some of those sorts of uh, ways of getting back to the context would be helpful. Thank you. That's a good idea. Um, if, I can, if I can add to tree species, I'm, I work very closely hand in hand with the tree commission and the planning department. We've actually developed a list of appropriate um, and acceptable trees to be planted in East Providence. So I'd uh, recommend you reach out to the planning department. Um, they can certainly provide that list to you. I think the other thing I would say is uh, one of the things that's on uh, item two here, once planted the, these trees, the new trees, will receive the same status and care as existing trees. I think they have to have a much better care than existing trees. Getting trees started takes a, some doing. I think the next several items here are tree related. 
Um, so we rely on Sarah's comments and the tree commission to address these going forward. Do you have any other comments on the uh, tree shades canopy development area? Um, I just, I think the, they've complied with the numbers of trees and so on for the canopy cover. It's just the trees growing in parking lots don't do as well as trees someplace else. So we really have to make sure it's well planted and with, with the proper uh, growing conditions for them to thrive. Thank you. So we'll, we'll move on from that uh, to paving. Oh, oh my, my bad. I had one question. Uh, it speaks to uh, public greens and the gathering spaces and the, uh, the uh, non-amplified music uh, being you know, permitted encouraged. So I just had a question for the applicant. You talked about the amphitheater. Are you anticipating any amplified music there or just non-amplified? We are not contemplating any amplified music at the amphitheater. So um, I know that's the narrative on that is kind of taking its own life and I appreciate the opportunity to, to clarify. There will be, there's no plan for amplified music at that location. Thank you. Uh, regarding looking at some of the uh, uh, depictions that you have, the renderings that you have for outdoor dining, um, you know, cafe tables and umbrellas there for the middle of the summer. Uh, the amphitheater, I think, is going to be a great attraction to a lot of people, just whether it's the public or whether to have events there, whatever it might be, speakers or weddings, whatever it might be. Uh, it'll be just as hot there as it is in the, at the patios. So I seriously think that you should consider some kind of uh, removable shading uh, in the area of the amphitheater so that people can enjoy that on a hot day and, and, and have that great view uh, over the golf course and, and to the bay. Uh, I think uh, shading will make it much more inviting on those, on those really hot days. That's great. We, we've incorporated a couple of tent locations uh, along the parkway, but uh, there's certainly opportunities for more shade you know, within the plaza space as well. So that could be tented, that could you know, and, and not foliage, I mean, just right, artificial. Right. Sorry about that, I did skip that item. So are there any other comments regarding uh, open space, dining, amphitheater, et cetera? Okay, on to paving. Um, I just had one question here. I just, we'd like to make sure that we get some sort of slide or some, some, uh, documentation that you met the uh, not exceeding 20% um, hard surface in the area. So I imagine it's in one of your documents. There are a lot of them. So just make sure we, we conform with that as well as um, as we move through the process, we'd like to have some more information regarding the pavers, the, all of that information, some, some understanding of, of what you're going to use. Um, and how they uh, are going to be factored into the site and what the mix is going to be between pavers and, and concrete sidewalk areas because it does, it does have a big impact on the site. I would just add to that in terms of materials, the experience that the city has actually with, with stamped uh, bituminous uh, paving hasn't been fantastic. There's a little piece of it outside the front of the city hall here now, I think. Uh, but most of it's worn away, and I think we that should be take a different look. Okay, um, I guess we'll move to parking. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Yeah, before you do that, just full disclosure. Um, the last element of the grading uh, criteria talks about curb cuts and how they should be limited um, with no long, no closer than 100 feet between interruptions. The minimum of 50 feet from intersections, uh, and no curb cut shall exceed 20 feet in width. Just, just so we're clear, um, there's a disconnect between that requirement and the land development regulations and the street standards for the city of East Providence. I, we could attribute that to an oversight in the, in the whole number of, of design guidelines. This one, this one seems to have slipped the wire. It's simply not possible to maintain that threshold while at the same time maintain curb cuts that are otherwise in compliance with the entirety of the. Um, standards and, and protocol of the city uh, from Department of Public Works and Building Department and the land development regulations. I, I didn't want to pass that without without letting you know that um, you know we, we we're close to the extent we can, but but in order to maintain 
streets, curb cuts, and, and access ways in compliance with uh, the overwhelming city requirement, that, that element is, is not satisfied. Anyone from the city have a comment on that? Can you just elaborate a little bit more on that, please? So I, I think what what we're getting at is that 20 feet for a curb cut off of a street doesn't really allow for like a typical 24 foot, 30 foot dimension for that access drive that we're going to have. It's, it just doesn't quite match up. Um, and I'm not sure if it's... Uh, if the intent is for for that to be more about a residential driveway, like to a single unit, might only want to have a twenty foot curb cut. That would make sense, and maybe that's what the intent is. I I, I think there residence. it's the confusion, the difference between access roadway, right. and right. as you're saying, okay. Curb cut. As long as we that's exactly right. That's that's right. where the disconnect is. It's just yeah. verbiage. I mean, we we believe we comply with the intent, but not the literal application. And again, when it comes to that, just specify where it's not needed as a single residence. Absolutely. Thank you. Any additional comments? Okay. Parking. So, Josh, you had mentioned that you were seeking a variance on parking. Could you explain that a little bit, please? Sure. So, um, you know, we there's a certain parking requirement in the East Providence zoning regulations applicable to mixed-use developments. Um, so, so we have to comply with that requirement on a per bedroom basis and on a per, per peer footage basis for the commercial uses. Um, I believe as a result, and in order to, uh, you know, there, we've gone through different parking configurations for those of you that have spent some time on the project, you've seen the, the incarnations, um, in order to, to up to this point, incorporate as many comments as we could with regard to, uh, Sarah's concerns about landscaping and, and all the other consultants. In order to, to try to make the enhancements that we've made thus far, we are, I believe, short 12 spaces. And so we have we have a few thousand, but we're short 12. So we've asked for one of the variances we've asked for is a variance to allow relief for those that 12 space adjustment. All things being equal, we'd much rather give up the 12 spaces in order to effectuate um, some of the, the landscaping and, and other uh, offsite improvements that we've contemplated. But and but again, the, the application says that when you need a variance, ask for a variance. So so we do not comply with that requirement. Thank you. Comments on parking? No. Nope. Can you also elaborate on parking as opposed as how it relates to the phasing and how much is it going to be proportionate to to the work that's being completed? It is. So and we'll still meet the guidelines based on that. Yeah, so the variance, I think, for the 12, regardless of how you allocate it, um, I mean, I guess for the entire group, if you go six and six but for, for equitable purposes, uh, the development still complies with the, the appropriate applicable parking requirements for the phase for the parking fields that are contemplated, let's say, with six. So, so um, we are not, when we do phase one of the improvements, and it's the commercial and the, the first generation of, reach of uh, residential, there will be at least sufficiently parked. Um, when we go to phase two in years six to ten for the balance of the residential there will be sufficient parking there as you know there's a certain parking requirement per bedroom um you know as we go more and more buildings that's obviously more parking intensive uh so so that's obviously where more spaces are on that portion of the property but as we build out there will always be commensurate parking um for for what we build out we don't intend to be short um at any point during the construction process I know there were a few concerns um, regarding the large parking lot at the grocery store. Um, is there any way we can put that slide up there? So it, it looks as though you have made an effort to incorporate trees into that parking lot. Uh, Sarah, do you have any comments on, on their use of trees in that lot? I hope they all live and prosper. This, 
this is the line. Or, or relocate, or at least uh, break break it up with some trees. Or I, I think that that's the problem one for me. Um, if, if that there could be some relief there to find parking elsewhere, we'd do better. I agree. If we could break that row up a little bit, that'd be great. Or get rid um, of it. <laughs> but they they have made an effort. They have um, to to incorporate trees into the parking lot. It doesn't. It's not your typical expansive parking lot with no vegetation. So if, if we could look at a couple of those comments, I know you're already looking to have less parking, but and we don't want to take any more away from you. There's also a requirement here for vehicle charging. Um, can you speak to that and how you're addressing that in, the, uh, in this project? Presently on the plan, we haven't uh, designated any, but we're more than willing to do that. It depends on how many we think you guys are talking about. It hasn't really been discussed yet, um, but there's definitely opportunity to add EV spaces throughout. throughout. So we're looking at, by the, by the regulation or by the guidelines here, uh, we're looking at one station per 100 spaces um, for commercial parking. And then um, the residential parking is is a uh, it can be a phased effort. So if you could just take a look at those those vehicle charging requirements and and pull together a, a plan of, of how you'd like to address that and approach it sure. going forward. On the plan. Yep. One thing to note, um, fire department mentioned they didn't want any EV spaces in, in the We have some parking underneath the residential buildings, but they want to keep them. So understandable. Those those things you can't put them out when they when they start when they burn. So. A lot of times they're starting to put these things further and further away from the building. But um, if you could come up with with um, a direction on that, because it, it's where things are moving forward and there will be a need and people will be asking for them. One of the things we wrestle with on that is providing so many of them that it takes away parking for people that don't have them. Uh, one solution we've employed elsewhere is to have spaces that are EV ready so that they can be um, modified as the demand increases, uh, but to try to find a number of actual EV spaces that, that sort of goes with where the market is today and allow for that um, to develop in the future. So we'll get back to you with a, the proposed kind of program for that. Because the commercial parking is only a fraction of the total parking on the, on the site, right? So at one to 100, it, it, it's maybe two or three. Probably, I would think. What's your total parking on the site? Is it four and change? Yeah. So take away the residential parking um, and look at them separately and just come back with a plan and it can be discussed at the next meeting. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments related to that? No. <laughs> um, site services. So that I did have one question on this, and it, it is a little early in the process, but um, there are requirements here for screening rooftop units and and et cetera. So I know that come that comes with building design and mechanical design and and all those items that are probably haven't been developed at this point. But we like you know an understanding of how you would look to address those items going forward, and and. Put a plan in place on on the smaller residential structures. Are they going to be, you know, pad mounted units outside? It's more of the grocery store, and some of the bigger units where I think you'd have a little bit more, a um, little bit more of an effort to to hide those things. They're not easy. I, I understand, but um, it is on the guidelines here. And if you could kind of look at it and and come back with some sort of uh, plan on how you're going to address those. We intend to comply with. Um, the site services criteria with the exception of the transformers, um, which had previously been dis discussed, I think, in some of the design work about that um, planting and buffer, planting, buffer, or screening um, of transformers uh, requires commission approval. Only uh, we have discussed this with the design uh, workshop previously. I believe we, we contemplate, you know, we are proposing um, 
planting uh, or a buffer or screening as it relates to certain of those things. So we could call the commission's attention to that. The, the guidelines do allow for that possibility. In just need to coordinate that with the utility company for, for maintenance requirements and et cetera to make sure it's not too heavily planted so they can't maintain them, the units going forward. So um, I, th I think that's something that the commission would 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 look at and discuss if you chose to present uh, an option to screen with vegetation. Understood. Uh, not, not knowing much about uh, electrical things, uh, I don't know how many transformers you have, but will you have them all in one spot? Or will they be distributed about around the, the property? They will be distributed. Okay. So, it, so it, yeah, if you can, I would connect with the utility company as soon as possible. Pretty much, I guess, the way you can summarize any building you see is going to require it would take. Also going to be some requirements for switching modules like switch gears and so forth so it is going to be quite extensive so utility company has specific requirements that they're not be able to plant um, block access be able to operate and so forth but again I think the sooner you connect with them the sooner we can get and also it's not just the real estate for the transformers themselves the underground infrastructure is the pad itself so it's much larger space to plan as I guess with that little disclaimer stated there, has that all been calculated with time? How much is enough to plan for that? How much is enough for some of the green space or parking? Yeah, so uh, the plans now show some um, preliminary locations for transformers to begin with. I don't remember how many we have, but it's enough to ask to initiate discussions with the utility company, which we're, we're willing to do. And with that, do you have expected loads? Yeah, that I I don't I don't have them personally. We have those, and we'll have a week to get those checked out. And if we look at the demand, we'll have to get those in service and provide the information that we need. That we need. So electric and gas. Also, this is going to be a good same thing. We're going to you know coordinate. We'll be coordinating with the gas company again. We have enough information from the plans to show them where the gas reactors are, and then we'll go through the whole load with them, and they'll have some additional information that we need. And aside from transformers being visible, meters, so electric meters and gas meters will be visible too. So aesthetics and the looks of the meters I think would be good for the rest to be able to especially with these buildings being foresighted in their design so it, it's just going to be strategic in some strategic planting some strategic fencing you know it's probably going to do the best to uh, start to hide these items and, and I think we can um, entertain those suggestions as as we move forward if, if I could add a, a bit to this discussion um, so we have, as, as part of the, the request by the fire department to give us give more information on the fire protection side, we brought Wozni Barber, a, an MEPFT uh, engineering firm, on board, which, uh, you know, often at this point in a, a process of overall site plan review, we wouldn't necessarily do that. We're sort of now bringing them on on the engineering side. They're also going to be helping us with uh, preliminary narratives for the uh, both the electrical HVAC uh, side on the buildings as well. Uh, so we can start to to get some better, more engineered information on, on these things. I think they're all great points. We need to be you know, thinking about where transformers are, where the electrical services, where where the meters go on all of these buildings, so we, you know, can screen them. Often that's something that you know happens as we're developing the buildings through construction documents that, of course, we'll submit to the city for uh, review for you know before we do building permits on any of these. So it's it's sort of a another level of design. We're starting to get to some of that information. We might, we won't final designs as part of this process, certainly, um, but we'll certainly keep these, these items in mind. It's understandable. It's just, uh, we just want to make sure you keep these items in mind moving forward. And we, we do, I do understand where you are in the process. And, you know, at the phase we're in, I didn't expect you to have fully engineered drawings because it's just, it's, it's not practical. But definitely keep these items in mind and factor them into your design. So, uh, Put the microphone a little closer to you. Yeah. Uh, so it sounds real loud. Apologies for that. Is this go. better? Okay. And would you like me to repeat anything that I had mentioned before? Or, all right. I don't think anybody wants to hear me speak again. So that's. So, yeah. So there's going to be several transformers on the site at this point in in the development of the project. They don't know exactly how many. 
So um, those locations will be will be presented as they move forward with the design. Any other comments on this particular item? I, I had a screening at the dumpsters too, just make sure that that's all addressed as part of your as part of your um, final design, whether it's fencing, landscape, you know, whatever is appropriate. I'm sorry, just one question on utilities. Is there any plans for solar at any point on the buildings or roofs or anything like that? So uh, that is, I guess, an aspiration under the guidelines that we incorporate solar. We are currently looking into it. Um, the ultimate configuration of the buildings and their layout will obviously affect what's solar appropriate and what's not from a renewable standpoint. So as the site, um, as the permitting gets further along, and we have a clearer idea of what our building configuration is, we can we can pursue, um, you know, whether it be panels or some other solar configuration. So, but we need to, you know, we obviously obviously we need to get the design approved, and then we can continue. But our intent is to is to adhere and and provide some sort of renewable function element um, when it's constructed. Thank you. Um, are there any other comments regarding site services? to uh, design elements and structures, building height and massing. Um, I know, Glenn, you had a few comments on this. Would you like to lead it off? Sure, we've already touched on a few of the items. Um, obviously, the, scan, the screening of mechanicals we talked about a bit. Um, you've already um, touched on and done a very good job of moving the larger structures inward to the site, so those things are all great. The one thing I will say on your larger um, residential structures, the, especially the five-story ones, are still very boxy. And I mean, really the goal is that those planes, based on those maximum, maximum surfaces, are breaking by five feet. So I think there just needs to be some more discussion as you further develop the designs of those structures. Because right now, unfortunately, especially on the five-story five high portions, it really, the roof doesn't feel proportional to the structure below. Um, it, it feels like this little hat sitting on a big box. Um, so I, there's different ways to approach that, and I think that's something that we can discuss as we develop it further. But I, I think you're aware that that's something we're going to have. Uh, you, you've raised that previously. It's a, it's a helpful comment, and, and we continue to work on it. Thank you. So that's really all I had for the height and mass. I'd like to add. Um, I think it's on here as well. The the ten garage structure. I'm not a big fan of at all. So I, I think you have the opportunity to push that building in and out a little bit, so it's not hundred feet long of straight. Um, so if there's enough room on the site, I, I was going to hit on that somewhere oh, else. Yeah. But yeah, okay. Well, there is there is enough room on the site there to do. Two doors, kind of pull it a little bit. Two door, you know, just kind of stagger it a little bit. Work with the roofs and pull the proportion down because it's just gigantic. Um, it's actually funny because you guys designed that particular structure. Of all things, it should be super simple and utilitarian, and you've added these dormers roof lines onto it that don't really seem to serve any purpose because they're way higher. The roof lines way higher than the garage, way higher than the windows. It just makes the building feel big and box. If you really play the scale down, and as you suggested, maybe break it into two buildings with the space between them, uh, just it, it feels awkward. It, it, could, it could still be one building, but I, I think you just you, you jog it. You got to push and pull it, do a little thing, because there is enough room on the site to do that and still accomplish what you're looking to do. Um, and understand that, you know, to get some dedicated garages is, is, is a site amenity, and it's not something that, that we would discourage you from doing just. Um, yeah, I think the other great thing about that garage building is it's it's providing some screening from the boulevard of that right. parking field, right? So if we're certainly open to, to working on the architecture of that building, and, and I agree with Steve completely, we can, you've got that kind of curve on the site, you can start to step it back with that, that curve and, and break down the, the mass, and we can take a look at the roof lines on that as well, Glenn, and certainly address those. And I do agree with Glenn that there are some large gables up there that really need to be broken down a bit. Um, that really oversized, like 80 foot gables or, you know, they're, they're big. So I think that 
I think you've done a nice job with the smaller scale and bringing some of those smaller residential elements into the larger building just to kind of get the, 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 um, the project to feel whole between the small and large project, uh, small and large building, sorry. Yeah, we're, we're happy to take another look at that. Thank you. Does any of the other commission members have um, comments regarding building height and massing? Um, we'll, we'll touch on this further as we, as we go through the process and, um, building design. I know, um, Dave, you had some comments regarding this. We could pull up the, uh, the color palette. You want to look at that one more time. Uh, the colors are all New England colors, and they look really nice. I appreciate them. Uh, I'd be, uh, <clears throat> I guess, the darkest one, the the night gray, is the one that you might use with, uh, with some uh, uh, a minimal amount of it uh, because it's heavy, uh, and the lighter colors obviously are lighter, and, and architecture always looks better when it's not so dark. Uh, I could point to other other uh, places that I've seen that they just look uh, heavy and monstrous. So uh, to use that uh, the darker color for trim uh, might be a, a preferable uh, use of that color. Simple as that. Are there any other comments on color? <clears throat> I, I think that ultimately, as we move through this process, if you could um, just bring us some physical samples of small ones, you know, don't you know, don't go crazy, um, but some stuff that we can touch and feel and and. Um, I don't know what the products specified there. Are those are is that a cement based clapboard? That's up there. Yeah, like a, a hardy plank type like of product. A hardy plank. Would yeah, typically specified. Yeah, so I mean, ultimately you're going to be re requesting those samples and pulling them in anyway. So if you could just bring them to to a meeting as as we go forward here. Sure. So we've kind of gotten through most of our items here. Renewable energy is the last one. Um, I actually do have one, yeah, please. just to jump back on under building design item three. Um, can you put up the, um, the detailed site plan of the commercial area? Sidewalk is instead from the sidewalk. Something similar in here, except that utilizing both sloping up and projection. It's not fun. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great suggestion, Glenn. We can definitely take a look at that. Any other comments regarding building design, structure, massing, finishes? You already hit you know, my concern about the garage. So. Okay, great. Um, last item here is renewable energy. Um, we talked about this just a little bit a few minutes ago. Um, just uh, tell us what your efforts are going to be, and and um, you know, kind of report back to us at the next next um, meeting. The 
meeting is kind of dragging out here a little bit. I apologize for that, but there's a lot of information to go through. Um, there's just a couple of items I wanted to touch on before we open up the public comment. Um, there are a few studies that, that have been submitted. The architectural assessment, we don't have any update right now based on our last meeting. Um, we appreciate all the comments and um, they are pursuing a permit to conduct that study. Once that information is available, the applicant will report back to us and we'll, we can discuss that at future meetings. Um, the, the public safety study, um, in reading that, it sounds like um, there was some missing police information on that one, and it, is that going to be updated? That's more than likely it's not. So, so just some context on that. Um, that assessment came about as a result of a request from the, the chief of the fire department who asked for public safety. He was specifically concerned about emergency vehicles and access and, and what the impact would be on municipal services. Um, the fire department was extremely forthcoming with the consultant that prepared the report. Uh, unfortunately, the police department has been otherwise occupied for obvious reasons for the, the past few months. Um, we reached out again recently. They, they just are, are completely um, overwhelmed right now uh, due to everything associated with the Washington Bridge and the associated traffic control. Uh, the fire department, you know, we, we received a letter, as you know, from the fire department that said that they require further information, which we're providing to them. Um, they did indicate, and we will provide this confirmation to the commission, that they were satisfied with the results of the assessment as we, that, they, that their concerns were addressed by virtue of that, of that report. Um, our, our financial consultant, his report also spoke to the impact on municipal services as well, to some extent, and he spoke about that at the first waterfront meeting. So, you know, absent comment from the um, city departments, namely police or fire, that further updates are required, you know, we'll continue to reach out to the police department. And, and again, it's our understanding tentatively that the fire department is otherwise satisfied with the conclusions in that report. Thank you for the update. Uh, then also regarding the um, traffic study, obviously we, we've talked enough about the traffic study today, so you'll provide more information as that becomes available. The noise impact study, I know that there was, there was some questions on that, and is, is that being updated? The noise impact study? The noise impact study is being updated uh, for couple of elements. Um, it will speak to um, uh, truck traffic along Veterans Memorial Parkway or operation property, operational property, excuse me. And we are also getting the, um, the, the consultants that John referred to earlier, uh, whose name I'm going to butcher. Um, they are also um, assisting us with information as to HVAC and other building systems for all the buildings in the development. So we can assess or estimate the noise level of those operations um, so that we can incorporate those into the noise report as well. So the idea is to focus not simply on, on construction vehicles during the course of construction, but also the operational components. Once it's built out, what do we estimate the, the impact to be on the, on the neighboring community? So that is being updated and we hope to at our meeting next month have an update on it, if not the, the update report itself. Thank you for the update. If, if I can ask one question, um, Probably should ask before. Are there going to be uh, backup generators in each of the buildings? And there is a large outage or situation. Will that be incorporated into the uh, the noise study with regards to HVAC systems and portable generator or backup generators operating? We're not quite to that point yet, so we haven't made any determination yet whether that'll be something that'll be built into the project. Certainly with the grocery store, there may be some, right, with where we have the refrigeration and things like that. So we can anticipate some of that, but as far as the rest of the development, not determined quite yet. I would have said the same thing, probably the grocery store for refrigeration. Um, and that's tucked away in the back, but if, if you could mention it to your noise consultant. to We've actually already provided the noise consultant with um, sample grocery estimates of the noise from their, from their generation as well as their, their trip impact in terms of truck travel and everything. So that element we have, and he's incorporating to the report, as opposed to getting in interim stages, we're gonna wait to update, submit an updated, hopefully comprehensive noise up summary um, for the this committee and the commission's uh, review and approval. Thank you. 
Uh, before we move to public comment, are there any other miscellaneous comments from committee members? Anything that we haven't covered or well, anything? I wanted to point out there is a new fiscal impact peer review being conducted by the city, which will be available at some point. But that's, that's all I had to update on. So, so um, is there any comments from the developers before, I mean, the uh, applicant before we move to public comment? Okay. So we'd like to open up the meeting to public comment. I ask that we try to be as respectful as everybody else's time as, as possible, and we're going to stay here and answer your questions, but please uh, step to the microphone and give us your name and, and uh, what you'd like to say. Thank you. Linda Leap from Riverside. And I'm wondering if the public will be allowed on the golf course for cross country skiing and walking in the winter. That's my question. I'd have to ask the applicant that um, if you'd like to respond. It's probably an insurance issue, but I don't know. Unlikely for cross country skiing. Um, that that would destroy the the golf course um, for for the, the uses of it and. Um, you know, the, the maintenance and the upkeep of that course is, a, is of significant expense, and it's obviously on the developer's dime. Um, I forget what the other activity that you asked about was. I'm sorry. Just walking. Possibly. Um, we, we have to see. There's a, there's, we, we have to see, possibly, I guess, but no decision has been made in that regard. All right. And I am glad to hear about solar panels and a couple other things. Um, maybe a public vegetable garden would be nice in the area. I don't know if that might be an idea. And the roundabout, somebody, somebody said that pedestrians are not hurt in roundabouts. I think it's because nobody ever walks in them. Have you, have you ever gone to Apanag and tried to walk around there? It's pretty scary. So I'm glad there's going to be a, um, a crosswalk for the pedestrians separate from that. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll take a turn. I hope to be brief. I know that we must all be hot and tired. I know I certainly am. Um, Good evening. Uh, I think most of you know me. I am Candy Seal. I'm co-director and president of the nonprofit organization Keep Metacomic Green. Begun by five residents in July 2020, KMG has grown to nearly 3,000 members and continues to grow. Our membership is made up not only of East Providence residents, but of former residents, East Bay residents, golfers, bike path users, historians, environmentalists, lovers of green space and wildlife, protectors of the parkway, and an assortment of others who are distraught that the iconic Metacomet site will be converted into concrete and asphalt. Our written position statement has been submitted to the committee along with our response to the Crossman traffic study that was submitted to RIDOT on December 29, 2023. We request that these two documents be entered into the record of this public hearing. Our statement was written in mid-March in preparation for the scheduled hearing on March 20th, which was canceled due to inclement weather. It is divided into three major sections, a discussion of process, followed by an enumeration of GM KMG policy positions, and lastly, several broad design comments and recommendations. Please refer to our two written statements for details and citations to state law, the 2003 East Providence Special Waterfront Development District Plan, the City of East Providence Comprehensive Plan, City Zoning Ordinances, and City Council Directives. On Monday evening, the Planning Board voted to table a motion for 60 days on the consistency of the developer's plans with the City Comprehensive Plan. The board members cited the absence of a number of critical items that needed to be resolved, including reports and peer reviews on traffic and parkway concerns, infrastructure, stormwater drainage, and the archaeological survey of the site. We are encouraged that you are concerned with the same issues. During the planning board meeting, Mr. Berlinski argued for the developer that his application had been certified complete by the executive director of the Waterfront Commission. That is correct. However, as we discussed in our written statement and will address below, 
The certificate was far from complete when Mr. Levy accepted and certified it on December 28, 2023. Some of the issues we raise about improper implementation of process have either been resolved or rendered moot subsequent to mid-March, but we include them for the record and for the information of the committee and the general public. First on to process, the issue of the improper composition of the committee as then constituted has now been put right thanks to KMG's efforts. Also has mentioned a moment ago, KMG is of the firm opinion that the developer's application, which was submitted to Mr. Levy on December 27, 2023, and certified as complete by him the following day was far from complete. There were several deficiencies, including, for example, the required noise impact study that was not submitted until December 29th, the following day, and which did not include a study of truck traffic. Another example is the last minute and admittedly rushed submission of the public safe safety study which was a required impact study in which the author of this study stated, overall, the short time frame and unavailability of much of the required data means that this report is less complete than I would like. As a further example of the application's incompleteness, the first traffic study by Vanessa used outdated traffic counts and analyzed a previous plan with proposed retail space far less than the current plan. The supplemental traffic study was by Crossman, primarily used Vanessa's data, and was submitted on December 29, 2023, again, the day after the application was filed with the city clerk as complete. We find the most significant missing piece from the application is a document from the developer's architect certifying that the application complies in form and substance with city zoning ordinances, or if it does not comply, a fully documented explanation of the requested deviations and or conditional use provisions must be provided, which it was not, as far as we can see in the original application. I find it interesting to have heard discussions about the design workshops and how everyone collaborated to take together to work on the design. We're concerned about that um, because that interested members of the public during the pre-application workshops Interested members of the public should have been present during pre-application design workshops. But that, um, that concern is moot now because that, that train has left the station some time ago. Another moot point on process is our concern that meetings and public hearings on this project have been taken out of sequence and have turned the process on its head. If the procedural steps had been taken in turn, perhaps the planning board would not have tabled its motion last evening due to incomplete information. Finally, on process, we address an issue that KMG has brought up repeatedly since last year at this time. That is the question of whether design guidelines are a mandate required to be followed as is written in state law and the 2003 Waterfront District Plan or are merely suggestions or aspirational. We urge you to look into this yourselves and ask questions. Moving on to KMG's policy positions, which are detailed further in a written statement. We feel the Waterfront Commission must comply with all requirements within Article 9 of the Zoning Ordinances pertinent to development within the Waterfront District. The Waterfront Commission must also comply with its own processes, as spelled out in its Developer Information Packet, State Law, and the 2003 Waterfront District Plan. We feel that no locally sourced public funds shall be invested in net comet development or the infrastructure needed to support it, specifically grants, loans from the City's Capital Improvement Fund, or tax increment financing. This is particularly true for traffic infrastructure. It would be a slap in the face of the people of East Providence, not only to have this massive development disrupt the quality of life, but then to have to subsidize the cost of infrastructure needed to support it. There shall be no deviation from the protections afforded Veterans Memorial Parkway as spelled out in the 2003 Waterfront District Plan and the Medicom Subdistrict Amendment to the plan. The developer shall not be permitted to erect an entrance sign on Veterans Memorial Parkway that is not limited in scale as required by the 2003 plan. As proposed, a large sign on the parkway listing retail establishments, I think that's called a ladder sign, is far from limited and sets a bad precedent for future developers on the western side of the parkway. I must also add that the discussion of the, uh, of the name of the project, uh, the Met, um, one of our Native American neighbors um, in, a, in a previous meeting uh, said that the, calling it the Met was disrespect, disrespectful, not only not dignified, but disrespectful to the original, original Metacomet. The 
the Native American, not the golf course. The developer must consider potential development on the western side of the parkway in the estimating demands on infrastructure, including roads, water, and sewer, with particular attention paid to the increased traffic on Lyon Avenue. The developer shall implement adequate traffic and noise mitigation measures to reduce traffic and noise impacts, particularly from truck traffic, including construction vehicles. The developer, developer must conduct an archaeological survey. Since mid-March, the developer has made a commitment to conduct the survey. The Waterfront Commission must require peer reviews of all impact studies conducted by the, by the developer. Some reviews are in process now. Apparently, the inadequate noise, public safety, and at least the noise and fiscal impact studies will be peer reviewed. We feel that the public safety impact study should be as well. The Waterfront Commission must ensure that after the public hearing phase is completed and prior to approval, the developer's application and plans are presented to the planning board to ascertain that they are consistent with the city's comprehensive plan. This harkens back to the topsy-turvy manner in which the approval process is being conducted. Finally, KMG offers some broad design comments and recommendations. Retain more mature shade trees in the interior of the development. 269 existing trees are slated for removal. We call upon the developer to conduct a boots on the ground survey of the site to identify mature shade trees within the development that can be saved. Public access throughout the development must be provided, including within the golf course. This suggestion drew to Snickers at Monday's planning board meeting. However, articles have shown that golfers and walkers can coexist peacefully with proper planning and cautionary signage. By council, city council directive and the city comprehensive plan, the public is required to have access to the waterfront throughout the development and throughout the year. The proposed 5,000 square foot maintenance structure and its related curb cut at the southeastern corner of the development should be relocated for the health and safety and the quality of life of the surrounding residents. Reduce the size of the proposed 98,000 square foot combined grocery store, retail, liquor store, cafe. It is too large and is contrary to the spirit, if not the law, of the use conditions imposed by the East Providence City Council in its vote to rezone the site and amend the city comprehensive plan. As well, the 2000 Waterfront District Plan states in part that new buildings shall not be single story large masses, similar to a big box store. The exact wording is conventional suburban type development characterized by individual large buildings with a single entrance set back from the frontage and containing a large expanse of asphalt parking, i.e. big box developments are prohibited. New buildings shall not be single story large masses. If that doesn't describe what I'm looking at right now, I don't know what would. In conclusion, KMG urges the Design Review Committee to follow the lead of the Planning Board in tabling any recommendations to the Waterfront Commission until unresolved issues are resolved. We call for, all, we call for the developer and all public bodies engaged in this massive and unprecedented private development project to respect the process, respect the law, respect the parkway, respect the site, and respect the community. Thank you on behalf of Keep Metacomic Green. Thank you for your comments. As you've seen from tonight's meeting, we are not making any decisions tonight. We've asked the developer to provide uh, information on many subjects throughout the process, many of which are in alignment with the items that you just mentioned in your letter. So we think this is a process. If we work together with the applicant and, and the community, I think hopefully we can come up with a resolution that is amenable to everyone. Thank you, Mr. Amoroso. Uh, I wrote this this afternoon, and uh, I, I should say that we are encouraged and thankful that uh, you are conducting your process, at least uh, the Design Review Committee, in the way that we hoped that you would. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Please step up and just give us your name and your question. My name is Renee Chicoin. I have a few questions from uh, the information that I heard tonight. The first one is about the amphitheater. Can we assume that the amphitheater will be run by a private company, not the city, or who will be managing the events and controlling that whole area? Mr. Berlinski, would you like to speak to that? It's owned and operated by the applicant. And again, no amplified music or performances are contemplated, but it's, it's, it would be subject to the purview of, of Metacomet property. 
So, um, yeah, you, you keep mentioning the amplified music, but I also heard that there could be weddings at the event. I've never been to a wedding that did not have amplified music. So, I'm, you know, acoustic guitar at a wedding is not typically. So, how can we? Miss? I don't want to just take you for your word. How do we? That, that's ensure? just a comment I made off the top of my head. I really don't know if there will be a wedding. No, no, I think the applicant mentioned weddings. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. It, I heard the applicant mention possible weddings at the venue. So, how can we ensure that there will not be amplified music at this um, theater? There are also noise regulations in the city of East Providence that every property has to conform with. And Pierce Field has to conform with them, all of those. So I, I don't know if it's within the rights of the applicant to have amplified music. That's that's not my decision. Again, you know, going back to my city days, in order to have amplified music, you have to have a permit from the city. So they would have to apply for that. And that would be a, a public hearing. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I had more questions. Um, I, I appreciate your comment about the crossing from the bike path because I cross um, the parkway all the time, whether on bike or on foot. And at least now you have a clear sight line in both directions and it's pretty easy to cross. But I, you know, if there's a rotary going on and I'm trying to cross that, that's just like too much for a person on a bike. Anymore. So I really do think we have to reconsider where that crosswalk is and the connection between the two um, the two properties. Um, I also heard in one of the comments that that there were sidewalks on Lion and there are not. I mean, I walk Lion all the time to get to Cafe Zara. <laughs> and once in a while, I'll be on a sidewalk probably this long and then I'm on grass and then I'm on the street and then maybe I'm on a sidewalk again. So if the city is going to approve this development and we know there will be an increased traffic on Lion, perhaps the city could consider improving the, the walking on, on Lion itself. Because right now you're in the street, you're going around cars, it's, it's not safe now. It'll be even less safe um, with this development. Are you referring to Lion further down yes, away from the property? Down. I know, okay. we know there are no sidewalks right now and right. I appreciate that a sidewalk will be put in, but it'll be that part of the development and not the rest of the so potentially as part of this the city's development of that L-shaped piece of property, they could extend the sidewalk from where the developer leads off or the applicant leaves off and continue it to the corner of Fort anyway. And then- Yeah, it needs to go all the way to Warren, but uh, I'm just saying, I understand yeah. it's outside the scope of the project, but it's something the city could consider in light of the increased traffic created from this project. If I can add to that, the city yeah. already has plans and we actually intend on uh, mobilizing a contractor within the next few months to make improvements um, from Fort Street North towards Warren Avenue. So uh, you should see contractors there in the next few, hopefully, weeks. Okay, thanks. And, and finally, again, I shouldn't call it a rotary, it's a roundabout, and I know there is a difference between a rotary and a roundabout, I believe, from a design perspective. Uh, we talked about um, the delivery trucks, especially for the grocery store, and I know they are allowed if they're delivering. And I hope that the design of the roundabout considered, I don't know how else the trucks would get there. And I know that when the roundabout was put in to the Henderson Bridge, some trucks got stuck going around because it wasn't wide enough for those trucks. So I know the trucks weren't included in the traffic study, yet they need to be trucks. And so I hope the roundabout design considered that a truck will need to get around the roundabout. They may just have to adjust their path to get to the facility and not go through the roundabout. And then they'll be on Lion. That's not a very good solution. Even in Lion Avenue, so. If the client wants to speak to that, please, please come on. The roundabout will be designed to accommodate the trucks. Typically, you have a raised center median, and then there's what's called an apron. It's a mountable apron for the larger vehicles that you know, would periodically use it. Typically, we have concrete treatment. You can see it on, on the, um, the ones that we did show. But there's a raised center median, but then there's a, an apron that allows for the larger vehicles. Thank you. Good evening. I am Heather Andre from Keep Metacomic Green. 
I would like to comment on the Veterans Memorial Parkway involvement in the Marshall Properties Plan. The VMP, formerly Barrington Parkway, was part of a plan by the Rhode Island Metropolitan Park Commission to construct roadways and parks in a circular fashion, leading in and out of Providence, Sim similar to the father of architectural landscape, Frederick Law Olmsted's Emerald Necklace in Boston. As a matter of fact, Olmsted Brothers, Sons of Flow, were the designers of the Barrington Parkway, as well as many other jobs all over the U.S. Even back in 1904, when construction for the parkway began, the leaders of the MPC stated that the Barrington Parkway land needed to be acquired for the benefit of saving open space for the generations still to come. The MPC believed, and rightly so, that the unobstructed views of the water and the trees and greenery were crucial to the overall well-being and happiness of those who traveled the roadway. Land was bought, donated, and even taken by eminent domain. The state of Rhode Island had land left over after the parkway was finished, and some sold, and still, and still the Rhode Island retained some along both sides of the parkway. The borders of the VMP Barrington or Barrington Parkway are part of the parkway, incorporated into the roadway for drivers and residents' enjoyment. It is not for developers to scoop it up with the intention of destroying the land with asphalt and concrete for the benefit of making a profit. That is the exact opposite of what the Metropolitan Park Commission had in mind when they saved this land. Veterans Memorial Parkway is a Rhode Island Scenic Byway and has all six attributes and qualifications needed to be on the National Scenic Byway. The parkway has more than enough qualifications to be on the National Register of Historic Places. In fact, these Providence politicians have told me that VMP is thought of as being on the National Register, so no need to apply. It will be treated accordingly. I don't see that happening right now at all. On the other side of that coin, I'm sad to say, is that the Barrington Parkway was selected by the Cultural Landscape Foundation as being one of the 12 most endangered Olmsted designed areas in 2022. Seeing what is being planned from a, for, from a developer for the Parkway and seeing some East Providence leaders seemingly fall over themselves supporting this decimation of the Parkway has me wondering, who do the leaders of East Providence support? the developers or the heart of East Providence, the residents. This is state-owned historical land. It's beautiful and soothing and was built with the need for open spaces for the public's interest and peace of mind. Stoplights on the parkway, they are not allowed in the East Providence comp plan. New curb cuts, not allowed. The comp plan does say development should be limited to the capacity of the parkway. It does not say change a East Providence and Rhode Island lands for a developer such as Marshall's Properties wishes. Obviously, four lanes on the parkway is way over the capacity of the parkway itself. These are all in the comprehensive plan. As noted, Marshall Properties plan has massive discrepancies with what is actually written in the comp plan. I would hope that you all see these discrepancies of Marshall Properties plan and act accordingly. You are all able to veto any part of this plan, and I would pay special attention to this Veterans Memorial Parkway because it really wasn't made for development. It was made for the people. And I'm, I'm not really sure why you think you have the right to invade the people's space. You bought the property, plan it accordingly from the property that you have, not the Veterans Memorial Parkway public space. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Be assured that this is going to go through all the proper process. It's going to go before the Scenic Highway Commission, if I use the right terms, I apologize. Um, and nothing will be snuck by. Um, they're, they're going to go through the process, and, and we'll get the comments back, and we'll discuss it as we move forward. Thank you. Um, my name is Diane Petrella. I live in Riverside. And just a clarification from, I think it was this gentleman here. Can you explain or help me understand how many cars, just statistically, how many cars, vehicles generally are going through the parkway now? And what will it be when this is done? Would you like to come up and address that? He's going to take over. Uh, traffic on the parkway has varied over the last two decades between 16 and 18,000 vehicles per day. And that's typically through traffic on the parkway because that's what it is. Um, with a point development, as we're proposing, um, we're going to, that our project will generate roughly 11,000 trips per day. 
that's not going to be all 11,000 going to the highway. So you'd see that up and it won't be 11,000 to the south and to Riverside. So it'll be, that'll be distributed on Parkway. So we're probably looking at around 20 to 22,000, which is typical of the um, intersections roundabouts I showed you earlier uh, in Wallet. That section of road surfaces 22 to 23,000 vehicles per day. And it's more that <clears throat> when you introduce a junction, that's where you require additional lane capacity. Beyond the junctions, you can taper down to, to single lanes that can accommodate the traffic. But at the junctions, whether it's a signal or a roundabout, you need that capacity to get through because of the stop and go nature of it. Thank you. Does that address your question? It's not really my forte. So would you say it's double, triple? Could it, or what would it be like? It, it was 16 to 18. He's saying about 22. So maybe 20 percent, or if that, if, if I'm doing math off the top of my head, um, somebody can do the no, math. It doesn't seem as much as I would think it would be. So well, it, it as if you'd like to explain it as the destination and, and all of that. Sorry. I don't want to speak to it because it's not my forte. Traffic on the parkway, the 16,000, you, you get the same people you know, up and down the parkway through the parkway going to destinations um, at either end. Um, so that's where the, the 16,000 to 18,000 comes in. We're a point development on, on the parkway, and it'll have distributed traffic. So we're not going to focus all the traffic. All the traffic, we're not down at, at Squanto. So if we were down there, all the traffic would have to come down the parkway to get there. So you, that whole 11,000 would be felt along the parkway. But because we're in the middle, that traffic will be distributed and a, a lesser volume uh, would be realized on, on either section to the north or the south. Thank you. So if I understand, Mr. Bain, some, some traffic's going to be coming from the south, stopping there and going back south. Someone's going to be coming right. from the north. That, that's what I'm saying. Stopping it, it, in and going back north. So it's it's not like it's everybody is going both ways. Okay, I understand. The, the way I see it, right now you're looking at 16 to 18. Currently uh, proposed would be between 20 and 20, 20, 22. Thank you for doing the math. Um, that's still a, about a 37% increase, though, so. When you do the math. And I mean, that's just factoring in our, our project. I mean, there is other, there are other parcels along the parkway that, and this, this will be designed to accommodate those other parcels going forward as well, but by estimates, of course. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Dan Bodwin. I live at Kettle Point, East Providence. I have a background in city planning. I'm retired right now. Uh, but very interested in this project. Good to see everybody here. Um, there's a lot of numbers thrown around. Maybe it would be good to kind of condense it, clarify it. I'm looking at one study that says uh, the existing traffic count on VETS is 16.5. The future is 29.9. That comes out of the noise study. So, I, you know, there's just a lot of numbers. Maybe there's a way we, they should be all looked at again and corrected. Relating to that, um, and I heard this tonight, very good that there will be a peer review study of the Crossman study. I think there was one from Vanas. That's a part of the study, the traffic study. The other part is Crossman, and that needs to be peer reviewed, not only because you need the information, but also because it's a requirement of the city council when they incorporated Metacomet into the waterfront district. So I think I'm hearing that it is going to be peer reviewed, so I'm glad to hear that. Um, the changes in the vets have been talked about a lot. I just hope, and I know you guys are going to work and girls are going to work very hard, to make sure it's in compliance with the city's comprehensive plan, including the 2003 waterfront plan, which is part of that, in compliance with the waterfront special development district plans and the waterfront design guidelines. Now, we'll probably debate that and argue that as we go through the process, because there's some really tough decisions going to have to be made in order to maintain that that parkway as it was meant to be maintained as a parkway and not a highway. Um, truck traffic, this is the first time I'm hearing about truck traffic. Very enlightening discussion tonight, by the way. Thank you very much to everybody. Very impressive. First night I hear anything about truck traffic. Has there been any concrete other than, oh, the trucks are going to go on vets? 
know, it's going to be a lot of trucks, a lot of delivery van. How many are going to go through the neighborhoods? What are the noise effects on the neighborhoods? I heard about a noise impact study being updated. Again, terrific. I wasn't sure if that's going to include Mercer, Fort, and um, Lyon. I heard it's going to include the vets, I think. I'm not sure if it's going to include the residential streets. That really needs some up-to-date noise analysis so you can understand how the neighborhood's quality of life and health and wealth and safety is going to be affected. Those three streets are key. They're all residential streets, and they're going to feel big impacts. So I'm hoping that there's more studies in that, in that regard, both noise and traffic. Um, the traffic studies, in order the, peer, the studies to be in conformance with zoning, they have to identify who's going to pay for what on the off-site improvements. Now, I know Marshall's team said they're going to pay for the roundabout. That's great. I mean, but is that, going, is that going to be part of the traffic studies in accordance with the zoning ordinance that has to be part of the traffic studies? Who's paying for what? So I haven't seen that in writing anywhere. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, just stay on traffic for a minute. Um, one study, but our study, mentioned traffic demand management techniques to cut traffic down. They also then mentioned trying to get work with the city of Ripter and the developer subsidizing a shuttle bus to the Providence Transit Center. Is that still in the works? How do recommendations like that finally make it to the Waterfront Commission's recommendations as a requirement? Just curious, is that going to be part of the process, part of the potential um, requirements for the developer? Um, those are my traffic comments. I have a few on the design recommendations. Some of this will be repetitious because I agreed with a lot of the uh, speakers, and including some of, some of you. Um, save more trees. Uh, there's that old saying, well, when do you plant a tree? Sarah, you probably know this. Everybody's heard this. You plant a tree 20 years ago because it's there, and it's big, and it's shade, and it's healthy, as opposed to knocking trees down and planting other trees. They're going to plant a lot of trees. That's terrific. But I would suggest to take a, that the commission take a fine-grained look at the trees that are scheduled for demolition, just to see if any of those can be saved, if it makes sense. From a development point of view, topographic point of view, the condition of the tree. You know, I'd just like to see more, more trees saved if they could. Um, the, the sign on the, on the Veterans Parkway. I mean, that's totally out of scale with any other sign on the parkway. You look at the Metacomic Office Park, you look where I live, Kettle Point, very refined Kettle Point, that's all it says. Doesn't say orthopedics and big letters. Just Kettle Point. You go further down, the Squantum Club has this little tiny sign. Putting a sign like this is really like putting a sign on Mineral Spring Avenue. It really does nothing to do with the Olmstead original idea for this parkway. And I hope that you don't recommend it. I know the hearing panel's got to make a decision, but I hope you don't recommend those types of signs. Just a nice sign advertising, here's the development. You don't have to name all the different stores that are in it. Um, the pedestrian way uh, through the golf course. Candy mentioned that. Uh, that, again, I think is in conformance with the city council uh, requirement that there are pathways through the whole development. And it's not unusual. We just quickly, after the Monday night's meeting, went, did a quick Google search. We found 20 golf courses that have relationships with pedestrian path. It's done all over. In fact, it's done at the Newport National Golf Club. It's part of the Sakana Greenway Trail. It goes through there. It goes through around the golf course. And then I think it's going to go in actually into the new section that they're they're building. It can be done. It can be done. At least take a hard look at it because it's important that people have access to that water. That's one of the reasons why the Waterfront Commission was established, access to the water. And I think that should be given um, a really hard look. And I hope the developer will, will think about ways that maybe that could happen. The other access to the water idea is to extend the buffer zone um, down to the pond. It would require cooperation between um, Marshall between the city and the state. I know it gets tight there by the golf course, but there should be sidewalks and maybe a multi-use path that extends the path that ends now at the amphitheater all the way down to the pond and maybe to the bridge and maybe to Broadway. Let's make that a true bikeway that, that goes well beyond the development. So that's another idea. Um, Candy mentioned that 5,000 square foot structure at the corner, that's a maintenance structure. There's no focus on that, but it's on the plan. And I just, I don't know if the neighbors know that's going to go up. It's a 5,000 square foot garage is what it is with propane tanks outside, et cetera. I think the neighbors who live right near there have got to be told that this is going to be built and you've got to get reaction from them because it's going to be right in their backyards. You know, come morning, they're going to start the trucks up and then you don't want to surprise the neighbors. So that's something I, 
um, I hope that you consider getting better information out to the neighbor. And I think um, the other thing I'll mention is a lot of people mention how dangerous it is for bikes to go across the roundabouts, and it is, and I, I won't do it. I think, I think it was you, Sarah, who mentioned, let's move that, that crossing further south, you know, so where it's maybe only crossing two lanes as opposed to four lanes and going around. So if you take a hard look at that, I'd appreciate it. Those are my comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, everyone. Thank you. So um, just one second. No, no, not for you. So, um, it is getting late, so I'd like to cut this off at 1030. So that's 20 minutes from now. Or, so I just want to make sure everyone gets heard. So if how many more people do we have talking to? OK, we should be able to fit that in. I just please whoever's next. I just want to appreciate everyone's time coming here and I'd like you to be heard. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Doyle, and I live on the parkway at the corner of Mercer. <clears throat> and my main concern has to do with traffic mitigation. Um, Mercer, I think at one point, had a speed bump at the top of the street, which has been removed over the years. But uh, cars and trucks, I have dogs that I walk, and cars and trucks whip by there, and you're really at your own peril now. And I'd like to know if could, if could there be any plans in place with... Um, the mention of Fort Lyon and Mercer with these sort of traffic controlling devices before construction were to begin. Because with the Hennessy School right up the street and the playground across the street, I mean, it's a death trap to try to make it around there now. So, um, and the other issue that I uh, wanted to ask about was with the inclusion, the decision for what types of stores to include um, in the retail component and why the need for a liquor store. In Little East Providence, there are no less than eight liquor stores between East Providence and Barrington, uh, East Providence and Riverside. <clears throat> and I just wondered why, the, why they felt the need and to kind of have an upscale, um, in an upscale development like this, it kind of cheapens it and dumbs it down, in my opinion, to have a liquor store there. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Um, Bill, was, was a liquor store a permitted use within the, in that zone? I believe it is, uh, but I think they still, in order to get a license, they still have to go before the city council, I believe, okay. to uh, locally a liquor store. Thank you for your comments. August James, I live in East Providence. My question is, why don't we have a height limitation to some of these buildings? Five stories is way too high. It's going to stand out like an eyesore. This is a residential neighborhood. The homes are modest. At the most, there are three families, so there's three stories. It should, they should come down. They should come down to three stories, not five. It just it doesn't fit in, and there shouldn't be an exception. All the other developments that have been in, in East Providence are smaller. They're at the most three stories. The not, now the one over on the Wampanoag Trail is massive, but it's set way back. This is in the middle of a residential neighborhood. If you're going to develop it, be kind to the people who live there and have lived there. And how much retail is there going to be? Is it going to be in that one ginormous building? Are there going to be restaurants like fast food restaurants? I don't want to smell French fries. You know, there has to be more clarification. And you have control of this. You guys all have control of this. So take control of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, regarding the heights of the buildings, there was the city council approved the, the, the building heights in these areas. It's, it's not up to our purview. So um, it, it's, it's an approval by the city council, and, and it's, not, it's not up to us to, to mandate that. Uh, regarding the um, types of um, businesses that are going to be in there, if the applicant wants to speak to that, if not, we, we can, uh, they can provide that information as we move along. Please. Come on up. Hello, my name is Kyle Schumann. I live in Riverside. 
Um, pardon my outfit. I just came from a scout event not too long ago. So that's him. So what I have mostly is about nature and the outdoors of this. Um, the outdoor code is what I follow. It's um, clean my outdoor manners, be careful with fire, considering the outdoors, and be conservation-minded. I believe that's self-explanatory in most uh, sense of ways. Um, I'm one of the people who goes on the um, bike path quite often, and we already have two lanes, and why the need for four? These are all rhetorical questions you can think about. Most residents don't know about this road study, and quite concerning, I don't know why, because if you're going to do this, you need to inform the people of it. Um, but two square miles of all this for, um, I believe, the store, um, that's just taking away all the habitats of animals and stuff. And would sanctuaries be provided so these animals don't go into residential neighborhoods? My father actually had to take in his hands to take two coyotes who were on our street not too long ago and drive them up the street with a hockey stick because they had come into our neighborhood. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your comments. Well, Hi, my name is Steve Schumann. I'm from Riverside. And um, unfortunately, I have to use the readers nowadays. Uh, so, so I heard a New England town center. This looks nothing like traditional town centers in New England. It's not P-Town or Falmouth or Newport or anywhere on Block Island. This is another kettle point, boxy, boxy and boring, without personality, more fitting of a Levi Levitt town with a cookie cutter construction no visionary pictures of the overall site from the top or three-quarter view, the overall site, that is, because it would show the blight that this monstrosity will add to the community. We were lied to about how Kettle Point would look, and this seems to be more of the same. The only shot of, of the full um, complex concept shows it rising like a colorless vice and over the cove, ominously suggesting that the green area's doomed fate. Succinctly put, Olmstead would be aghast. Um, lit by LED lights, which are probably not dark light compliant, will generate massive light pollution that will stifle anyone trying to observe any astral phenomenon, yet alone the residents are going to have to put up with it. And yet, solar power, according to them, is only an aspiration. This was not in their original thoughts process? That's unbelievable. For 10 years, we're going to have to put, deal with this uh, car and truck conundrum. And now, the expansion of the VFW Parkway from two to four lanes is a nightmarish thought. With the addition of all this traffic, um, commercial in phase one, and then the apocalyptic residential phase two, the parkway will be overwhelmed and the surrounding streets will be plagued with cars trying to make cutthroats. Um, having just been in Vermont for the eclipse, I can now know how bad this can be. Um, the rotary was mentioned. The rotary, or you call it roundabout, I, I'm an Englander, so I call it rotary, will be just as effective as the one down by the Henderson, which it won't be. Um, crossing the rotary with yield control for bikes, yeah. Try crossing it with just two lanes. Your heart rate will be elevated. With a rotary, you want to make sure you have great insurance and a current will. Uh, the bike paths used by many, not just for recreation but for commuting, would be compromised either by its destruction or reconstruction because there's no way with the current plans that you're not going to be having to move that at a certain point in order to actually get that road, the two-lane roads each way, to actually... So four lanes, they're going to have to push the bike path back. So when that happens, any interruption of the path will force cyclists onto the roads with the traffic. And you can mark my words, expect your first fatality soon thereafter. Barrington's bike path bridges still have yet to be fixed. And for some fairly good reasons, I have no faith in the developers, DEMs, or DOT's ability, if they care, to remedy this. And I never, until now, mentioned the current problems with the Washington Bridge. Now, that unmentionable project, once resolved, would just be more of a traffic dump, increasing the congestion to Watchamucket and Riverside, which the current residents do not want. Whatever the developers or the studies say, remember, as modern populations grow, traffic grows, not necessarily just proportionally, but sometimes exponentially, especially if they're trying to get business 
to come to the area. We need more people in the area. And stagnation ensues. To the committee, please uh, reject these designs that will forever alter the landscape of this section of East Providence. And this is where I think history is going to take note, and us as citizens are watching. Do it based upon what over 5,000 residents who signed a petition wanted for the local wildlife and fauna, and for everyone who has young children, grandchildren, and future generations that would call this place home. Hold the people who are trying to do the developing to all requests and stipulations and ordinances. No concessions for the sake of greed, with no burdens on the taxpayers of this city, or tell them to go elsewhere rather than spoil our home. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is that all the comments from the public for tonight? Look at time. My name is Stephen Joseph McLaughlin, and my mother was a Rita Murphy, a Murphy. I'm fourth generation Irish. I can tell you some stories, but I'm not going to go into it. I'm going to go into one thing, what I read in the journal. And I'm not going to name names, but I'd be afraid if I were you people taking over Medicom. Have a good night. Thank you for your comments. Um, is there any other? Sure. Come up to the microphone, please. Why don't we just have a traffic light rather than, than the uh, rotary? Is there some real big reason? Traffic <laughs> engineer should speak to that. The, the goal of planning on the, on the parkway uh, was to limit impacts, and that's what we're trying to do. As was mentioned, you know, limit the number of new driveways. We're not proposing any new driveways. We're moving an existing driveway. We're limiting the impact of that driveway on the parkway by restricting movements that will go to a location that re would require control. That control we're proposing a roundabout because it's more context sensitive and something that Olmstead would design and is in, is in situations that would require control. Um, the Department of Transportation, they have in their policy that when you look at an intersection and we're reconstructing the traffic signal, look at the potential for replacing that signal with a roundabout. It provides slower traffic, safer traffic, uh, reduces vehicle conflicts, and, it's a, it, and has more capacity than a traffic signal and long-term um, maintenance cost. So it's in their policy and goals to try to, you know, use roundabouts where feasible and most appropriate. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, it looks like that's all. Um, does the applicant have any additional comments before we wrap things up? Thank you, Mr. Attorney Amor. So I'll be brief. Um, first of all, I just want to say how incredibly constructive tonight has been. I want to thank everyone for their time, members of the public. I, I do feel like this process was um, was injured by virtue of not having had the opportunity to, to make the presentation before this committee previously. This has been incredibly productive, and we appreciate everyone's time and dedication. And, and next time, please, let's make it warmer in here. Um, uh, a couple things just I want to point out is that, you know, I, I refer everyone I re request that everyone um, review the 2021 zone ordinance uh, in terms of the dimensional and use restrictions that are, are contained in that. They were quite extensive. There are tables and charts uh, appended to that ordinance, um, delineating everything from the height restriction to the potential uses, and, and we are in compliance with, with those restrictions. I know there's been some discussion about the liquor store previously. Just so we're clear, the ordinance states that 7,500 square feet of the liquor store has to be restricted to sales that no more of 7,500 square feet can be used for sales. The footprint is 10,000 square feet, but obviously if you know anything about liquor stores, there's a certain element of it that's for storage and, and backroom and administration. From a use standpoint, we are in compliance with the, with the ordinance and dimensionally as well. Um, the two last notes I'll say is that 
you know, there, there have been alleged deficiencies with regard to the application. Um, you know, in terms of everybody so far has had upwards of 90 days to review these applications. Um, we have tried to accommodate the city in its request for further time and further studies. If um, we had submitted uh, every, um, if we, we are utterly confident in, in the perfect application as of December 28th, I would be hard pressed to believe that this city would still not request an alteration, a revision, a modification, or a supplement. It is the nature of land use development in New England. Um, the, the, the development guidelines of the Waterfront Commission expressly provide for a process whereby we supplement and where the commission can request and we can provide further information. That is how this is supposed to work. Um, I, you know, for everyone's benefit, I can assure you that we are confident in our position that the application was properly certified complete and that we did identify the requested variances and, and deviations from the requirements and regulations that the, the um, waterfront regulations required. Um, I, I do want to just conclude by thanking again everyone for their time. Um, we look forward to coming back here and discussing um, the project, the modifications that you've discussed. Glenn and Sarah, thank you so much for your input. And, and we think this is an incredibly productive evening. Thank you again. Uh, Josh, could you just mention one thing? A number of people talked about walking through the area. There are walking paths that are designed in this from, from the beginning, a certain length of walking paths. There are walking paths throughout the development. There are obvious logistical constraints with generating walking paths through, walking paths through a golf course to the cove. Um, some of the developments that, that were uh, referred to, they, they, have, they don't have the same logistical construct as a nine-hole golf course that is adjacent to a cove. So inserting a walking path through the middle of that or in a particular con configuration presents significant logistical and health, safety, and general welfare challenges and that's a massive liability for the developer to assume. I'm not, let me be clear. We're going to look at, as, as Matt alluded to, we're going to look at whatever we can do to improve the access and visibility within reason. So, you know, I, for the same reason that you can't get a cut through through the grocer, which is the logical extension of that language, you can't walk through the fifth, the fifth hole um, just in order because that's the best sight line. So we're going to continue to work through this. We're going to continue to, to address the issue. We're going to come to you in the public with our concerns and any adjustments or modifications or amendments. But, you know, for to the extent that we've been able to provide walking, not to mention the 9.6 acres that's been given to the city that will be used for a public space, we're, we're making our best efforts. So we'll continue to do so. And, and we look forward to, to um, informing this committee and the commission of our, of our improvements in that regard. Thank you. Um, we're going to wrap up today's meeting. Amy's just going to. Uh... I don't know if uh, we have a date pinned down for the next DRC meeting. So at this point, it will be continued. If we don't have a date certain tonight, it will need to be re-advertised. As we committed to previously, for each design review and each waterfront commission, we have agreed to advertise that accordingly. So. So once that date is ascertained, I know the, the May Waterfront Commission date is, is on the calendar. We will re-notice, we will arrange for re-noticing in the publications as we've done throughout this process. Thank you again. You can uh, call for a motion to continue the application to a date to be determined in May. I assume it would be scheduled um, sometime before the scheduled Waterfront Commission meeting on in May, which I believe is Thursday, May 16th. What she said. So I call for the motion to adjourn. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, motion to continue for. Uh, we have a second. Second. All right. Well, thank you very much. Have a good evening. Vote in the adjournment. Oh, Jesus. Everyone in agreement? Aye. Thank you. <laughs>